Well, we're getting there. Hang on a second. I don't know why it's decided to start at slide four, but there's always some technical hitch. Okay, everybody. Has anybody got a camera that they can put on? I don't know, even if it's some of the organising, just so that I can see some thumbs up when I ask a question. So um, hopefully everybody can now see my slides. Can I have a thumbs up if you can see my slides? Absolutely brilliant. Right. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to this four hour um, webinar. Um, it sounds like a long time. You are going to be absolutely riveted. You're not going to want to leave your screens. I'm going to keep you entertained for four hours, as well as obviously teaching you all about how to write bids and tenders to win contracts with the London Borough of Newham and lots of other public sector organisations. So um, just a tiny, tiny, really quick bit about me, because I've only got you for four hours. So um, I've been writing tenders for well over 20 years um, and I run a tender writing business. So my team of people who are on the other side of that wall, um, we're probably writing about 30 tenders a month as a company. And we work with SMEs, small companies all over the UK, and we write their tenders for them. So we know what you're up against. We know the kind of challenges you're facing. We know the struggles that you have with public sector tenders and some of it it's just understanding what the heck it's all about. And I understand all that. And that's what I'm here to help you with today. Um, we are going to have two short breaks within our four hour training uh, webinar um, so that we, you can get a, a replenish your cup of tea or coffee, um, have a comfort break and deal with any urgent emails or phone calls, which I know we're all in business. So I know that happens. Um, we have had to mute everybody because one, we get lots of um, background noise and, and two, sometimes there's a lot of questions, which means I want won't get through my content but I do want to take your questions so please put questions in the chat or if we've got time at the end I'll try and address questions or um, again put questions in the chat and I can come back to you afterwards if that's um, if that's what uh, is required so um, we will address your questions it's just I can't necessarily do it on a one-to-one -one on this course so because I don't have the time um, you will all receive um, a copy of all the slides that are on the course today, and there are quite a few, and there's some handouts as well that actually give you extra information that um, I would definitely suggest you read them, um, because they're all for your benefit, so they will all come to you after the course, so um, hopefully that's all the, um, um, the housekeeping -y bits are, are all sorted, um, so we will crack straight on, because as I say, I am on a little bit of a time limit i feel like i've got the big countdown clock going do 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 do, do and it's just going to run out so i'm going to endeavor not to talk too quickly um but i do have a, a so much i want to uh, impart with you because um if you win a tender when you win a tender it's fabulous for your company it's absolutely fabulous to work with a public sector and there's so much work available for you in the public sector and the public sector is very positive towards small, small, medium-sized companies. And the public sector want to use local companies. So if you are in the London Borough of Newham or you are in the London area, you've got a real advantage. They want to use you. However, they can't just use you. You've got to go through a process quite often. And that process is called a tender. And lots of people get put off, get scared, run a mile when they know they've got to do a tender because it's so much paperwork and it's so confusing and the language used is just like it could be Russian and we've probably got people that do speak Russian. I personally don't, but it's very, very, very confusing. So tenders have to be put out by councils, by government departments, by the NHS, by universities, by housing associations. They're all public bodies and they have to put tenders out because they have to um, go through a very fair open and transparent process to select the suppliers that's you that they're going to work with they can't just pick up the phone and go here's a half a million pound contract you can have it it can't work like that it's got to go through a process and that process is called the tendering process and it can be quite confusing so if you have looked at it in the past and thought oh I'd love to tender for that but I just don't understand any of it most people feel the same way so you're not on your own 
there's lots of mandatory things in a tender that you have to pass. And if you don't pass, obviously you will fail. And if you fail, you will get kicked out of the, pro the, the process. It's like on Monopoly, you won't pass go. You won't pay, pick up your 200 pounds. So there are bits that you have to pass as you go through a tender. So you've got to make sure that your company is capable of passing those and can pass those areas. And we're going to look at some of those as we go through this, the, the workshop today. So there'll be a bits of the tender that you have to say yes or no to. Uh, and then there'll be other bits of the tender where you have to actually write answers. And what you write, it's like being back at school, is marked. And the best answers get the highest marks and the highest marks win. And that's what it's all about. It's all based on marking and evaluating your company, establishing whether your company is a risk. So can you do the job that they want you to do or can you provide the products or the services? Have you got all the right things in place like accreditations, insurance, we're going to go through all this, then how have you answered their questions? Have you given enough detail? Have you given enough evidence that you can do the job, that you have done the job before? So this is all what we're going to take you through today. You also need to remember that in some tender processes, not all, but in some tender processes, they might only be appointing one company to supply them there will be lots of different types of tenders and in lots of tenders they appoint more than one but in some they will only be appointing one supplier and let's face it that needs to be you because you're the best at what you do but unless you write the best tender and put in the right price somebody will beat you it's a competition to win business and you have to think of it like a competition not like a administration task that's been sitting on your desk for four weeks and you haven't looked at you've got to think of it as a sales as business development an opportunity for your company to grow take on more people get more business make more money that's what a tender opportunity is it's an opportunity for your business to grow and it's a fantastic opportunity and working with the public sector is absolutely fantastic because they will always pay you they will always pay you within 30 days how good is that as we know it by being private sector suppliers when we sometimes we have to wait months to get paid so you will get paid you will get paid within 30 days if you win a tender, you are winning the right to supply the council for possibly five years. That's secure business that you can nail, put your hat on and go, I've got that contract for five years, as long as you perform. Yeah, so it's a real, really, and they buy everything. The public sector buys pretty much everything supplies which is products everything from pens to tables to windows to they they buy services care services they security services catering services cleaning services gardening services street cleaning services you name it the public sector buys everything that you do your company does and that's why i hope you're on this course because you want to be a part of that and have a little bit of that just put some figures up on the screen there. And these are old figures because obviously COVID has caused all sorts of mayhem with uh, council spending. But in 2019, 2020, there's some figures there um, that, that, that just the London, New London Borough of New spent on services. So you're talking millions. And if all of you could have a little bit of that, how good would that be? And that's why we're here today. And that's why I want you to stay with me for the next four hours, because I've got some news for you and I can really help you in this tender process. So there's a huge opportunity for you out there. It's do not think I'm too small for this because councils, public sector organisations want to work with small companies and they want to work with local companies, but you still have to go through this process. Okay.
Newham is really, really forward thinking. It's a great council. They've got lots of information online. I went online this morning and I got, sorry, yesterday and got all those figures there about their spend. I've also been online and they, they have a monthly report that lists every supplier that they've spent more than £250 with. And there's a link to it there. So when you get these slides, you can just click on that blue blue bit at the bottom and it will take you to this, this report. So you can see who the council is spending money with now. And you should be looking at that list if you're a recruitment company or a care company or a, a, a window company or a cleaning company. Go, why are they using them? I'm better than them. I can do better service. I can do a more, uh, give them better service at a better price and I should be dealing with them. So then you need to say, well, why am I not? Maybe because I didn't go for a tender. And that's what you need to be aware of. So when you get these slides, there are another couple of links that I will uh, have put on the slide that you'll be able to go to as well. So before we go anywhere else, I'm going to cover off something that covers uh, causes quite a lot of problems with a lot of small companies and suppliers that haven't done a lot of tendering before. And it's good old jargon. And in every industry, so whatever all of you do, you will have your own industry jargon. And it won't mean anything to anybody outside of your industry. Uh, and we all do it and we're all guilty of it. Um, procurement is no different. And procurement people have their own, well, the whole of the procurement um, sector has its own jargon. Um, and they tend to use it and expect everybody to know what it is. And I was at a presentation a couple of weeks ago where a council procurement manager stood up and most of his 20 minute talk was jargon. I understood it all. I've been writing tenders for over 20 years. It made perfect sense to me. But most people in the room were totally and utterly lost. And I had to actually stop at the guy at one point and say, can you just explain what you mean by that? Because a lot of people in the room won't. So I'm going to help you there. You will see the term SQ, SQ, that means supplier questionnaire, and that's the first part of a tender process. If the council or any public sector organisation needs to spend over a certain amount of money, and it's normally around about £140,000, it could be, you know, £200,000 on a contract, and that's over five years they have to go through a formal tender process. And the first stage of that will be for you all to fill in an SQ, which is a supplier questionnaire. And that is basically the council or, or whoever the, the, the buyer is saying, who are you? What's your address? What type of company are you? What's your financial standing? And lots of other questions. And we're gonna look at an SQ shortly. So I will take you through what one looks like. But that is the first part of the process and it's only the first part. Okay, so that is the first section and that is pass or fail. Okay, the majority of the supplier questionnaire is if you answer it wrong, you will fail. Yeah, there will be parts of the some supplier questionnaires where you have to put in your references to say that you've got current clients that you do similar work for. And there will also be parts of the supplier questionnaire where you have to answer some questions which will be marked. But the majority of a supplier questionnaire is pass or fail. Yes or no. Answer it and pass or answer it correctly and pass. Don't answer it. You'll fail. OK, so the next stage. So if you are deemed to be compliant and you are deemed to be capable and competent and you pass that first bit, that supplier questionnaire bit, the next bit is called the ITT, which is the invitation to tender. And this is where it gets a little bit more complex shall we say i'm not trying to frighten you but the invitation to tender is where we are talking about how you are going to deliver your services you're you're writing longer answers to questions about mitigating any risks of failure how how talking all about your staff and your team you know talking about your supply chain talking about how you train staff how you vet staff it will depend you will all be in different uh, industries and you will all do different things so you will be asked different questions but the questions in the tender are a lot longer and sometimes you might be asked to write a thousand words 
So it, you are suddenly getting into a bit of a longer process. Also in the invitation to tender is where you get to put your price and you get to say, this is how much we're going to charge for what you want us to do. So if you have failed at the supplier questionnaire stage, you won't even get a chance to put your price in. So you need to make sure that everything is all good all the way through the process. We've already talked about SMEs, small and medium sized enterprises. So that would probably I imagine that will probably be pretty much everybody out there looking at me talking this morning. A small to medium sized enterprise is under 250 employees. So I think most of, the, uh, of us joining on this call to, on this workshop today will be SMEs. I think the turnover figures is less than 43 million. That would be nice, wouldn't it, if we could have 43 million as a turnover. So I'm certainly an SME in my company here so most of us are smes what does that mean to me positive it's a good thing the public sector the council has to have smes in its supply chain and it has to have a certain percentage so if you are an sme it doesn't mean you're too small and you can't supply to the council okay it's positive yeah so think of it like that there's another one that you will see, meat. And please, if you're a vegetarian, don't leave the course now. Meat actually stands for most economically advantageous tender. And all it is, is how the council or the public sector will mark and evaluate your tender submission. And it means they're going to put two different sides and weightings on it. And they're going to say... This tender is for domiciliary care services. So we are looking to appoint companies that can provide carers to look after the vulnerable in the Newham community. And they have to decide how important is price and how important is quality. So they'll go, OK, quality is really, really important because we need the best carers and the most skilled and trained that are suitably vetted and that are all enhanced security checks. So we're going to put 80% on the quality element of this. So 80% of the marks that you can score are for what you write. And 20% is for the price. And we're gonna have a look at it in a bit more detail and how that works further on in the workshop this morning. But if you see that it is being marked by the meat method, it means a split between quality or technical, the bit that you write and the price that you put in. And they will decide what weighting they put on, which is basically them, them saying to you, price is less important or price is more important. Because I've recently done a school uniforms tender for a public sector school, and it was 70% uh, price, 30% quality. So it just gives you an idea of what's more important to them. And I'll explain how we work with that later. OK, so we've got the next two. We've got DPS, which means a dynamic purchasing system, which probably means absolutely nothing to most of you. Uh, it doesn't mean it. I understand what it means, but why they call it that, I don't know. And the one underneath is called a framework agreement. Now, these kind of two link together slightly, and I could be here for the next five hours just talking about these two. I promise I won't be. I'm going to cover this quite quickly. Um, but you just need to understand that if it's a framework agreement that the council is going out to tender. So they've got a tender and it's a framework and lots of newums domiciliary care or care sector, adult care, children's care services, tenders that they put out are frameworks. And what that means is they are not just going to appoint one supplier, they are more than likely going to appoint lots of suppliers, could be up to, I've actually been on an NHS tender when I was in recruitment and there was 280 suppliers on the tender. I've just won for one of my clients a place on a teaching supply, so they're gonna be supplying teachers um, supply teachers to schools all over the UK and there's 120 companies on the framework you still have to go through all that tender to be awarded a place on the framework but it's not just about not just your company that's going to get all the work 
So a framework can also mean more than one buyer. So uh, in, there could be 15 of the London boroughs all get together and go out as a, as a, as a, as a, as a group of, uh, of councils and put a framework agreement out to buy services. So it could be more than one buyer, but it could also be more than one supplier. Yeah. Now, a DPS is a framework, but it doesn't always close. Some frameworks are like what I would call a traditional tender, where all the documentation comes out to you. You've got three weeks to get it all completed and all your answers written and all your prices dropped in and then you submit it and then that's it. It gets marked, uh, you get a winner, that winner gets awarded it and they have it for five years, three, five years. That's it, that's the contract and you haven't got another shot at that for five years. On a for normal traditional framework agreement, they might be, um, they might be appointing maybe 20, 30, 40 suppliers, and it'll be for four years. And you won't get another chance to get on that framework for four years. On a DPS framework, however, it opens and closes. So even if you didn't get on the first time, you can have another go. You can, when it reopens, or it might stay open all the time, you can realize what you did wrong put it right and resubmit your tender to try and get on that framework again. DPS framework tenders for, and I've just done one in London for taxi services. There's lots of them for the domiciliary care and the adult social care and the children's care. They remain open or they open and close several times a year. So the first thing that you should be looking for after this course, your first big action point of today, is write down DPS frameworks and then find out if there are any DPS frameworks live and open that you can apply for now. Because even if the framework's been running for three years and it only runs for four years, you can still get on it. And I've just got a taxi company onto a DPS framework, which is two years old. It's only got two years left to run and they've got we've got them on it and they're already getting business. So that needs to be an action point for you. Search and see and speak to the people at Newham and they'll give you their contact details to find out is there any DPS frameworks in the industry that I work in, in care, in cleaning, in, care, in taxis, whatever it might be that you do. And if it is, you've got your first tender to start on because you can apply for it straight away. Okay. Um, anybody has got any more specific questions on framework, please pop them in the chat and we will address them. But as I say, it's a huge area and I could be here all day and I, I can't be. So I'm going to move on. But please, if you have got any, pop a question in the chat. OK, you will see used a lot and people will talk about T's and C's. You need to agree to the T's and C's. They mean terms and conditions. If you are new to tendering and you are new to working with the public sector, you might be shocked to know that your terms and conditions, if you are working for the public sector, don't count for anything. You don't even send them them. They're not interested. If you win work with the public sector through a tender process, you have to work to their terms and conditions. So if you are working with Newham, you, they will have standard terms and conditions for suppliers and they will send you them as part of the tender, but you have to agree to work to them. Yeah, it's not your terms, it's their terms. So understand that. So you have to read all those terms and conditions because there's no point in you doing the whole tender and then on the day before you submit it, reading the terms and going, oh, do you know what? I don't like that. I don't want to do that. Can't work to that. Won't do that. Won't do that because you probably waited a lot of time and you have to work to their terms and conditions. Sometimes they will accept addendums, they will accept changes, but you've got to ask them. You've got to put a question in and say, we can't work to these terms and conditions because would you, would you look at changing this section of your terms and conditions or amending it? but you've got to ask the question. And if you don't, and you get awarded a contract, you'll be expected to perform under those terms and conditions. So please make sure you have read them. Okay. Lots of tenders come out 
with lots. So there you go. That's lots and lots in the same sentence, which I shouldn't really do. But what lots mean are different chunks, basically. So the best probably way to describe it is if there is um, if we are looking at um, housing maintenance. So housing maintenance of social housing properties can cover anything from roofing to damp coursing to new windows to window repairs it could cover all sorts and to go out for one ten with one tender looking for one supplier to say right we want you've got to be able to do everything so the company that we appoint has got to be able to make uh, you know maintain roofs and replace roofs you know maintain windows and repair windows repair damp you know look at damp cause redecorate well there are companies out there that do everything. They're huge, they're massive companies, and we all know about them. But if the council really wants to get SMEs, companies like yourselves on board, they need to break their tenders down, and they do. So if they have a housing maintenance tender, they will break it down into lots. And lot one will be roofing. Lot two could be damp course. Lot three could be window repair, window and door repairs. And if you are a roofing company, you only need to bid for lot one. You don't have to bid for the whole 25 million pound tender yeah you just go for the lot that you specialize in and you just answer those questions about that lot and basically what this does is it means smes have got a better chance of winning because you're not if you're a small company with maybe five or six employees you're not going to win a 25 million pound tender it's it, it, it's too big but you might win just the roofing lot to look after properties in the Newham area because you're a local SME and that ticks all the boxes. So have a look and don't be put off by a huge headline, housing maintenance services, 25 million. Don't go, oh, well, we're not looking at that. Have a look and see if it's broken down into lots and then you can just go for the chunks that suit what you do. Okay. Some of you, the next one will apply. Some of you don't. Obviously, we've got people from all different types of yeah, businesses on the, on the workshop today. But TUPE, T-U-P-E, TUPE. What it stands for is Transfer, Undertaking and Protection of Employees. And most of you are probably still none the wiser at what it means. What it actually means is if you are tendering and you are filling in a tender and you are completing your answers are all about because you want to win this contract. And it is normally when it's a, it's a services contract, this one. So just say you are a security company and you want to bid for the London Borough um, of Newham's public building security for man guarding or People guarding, sorry, it should be. I shouldn't have said man guarding, excuse me. So if it's a guarding tender where you've actually got guards on the ground and they are uh, looking after public buildings and the tender comes out, you don't have that tender now, another company does. And they've been supplying guards for the last, let's say, five years. In the public se sector, when it's a services tender, even if the company that's been doing it for five years has done an absolutely brilliant job, they still have to go back out to tender after five years because they have to have a competition, give other companies an opportunity to win, make sure they're still getting the best at the best price. So after five years in a services um, tender, irrelevant of how brilliant the contracts run they will have to go back out to tender so 2p applies when there are guards working for a company looking at doing the job um on already and then the council is going out to tender if you don't have the contract now but you put a tender in and you win you will have to take on employ the current staff working on the contract. So if there are seven guards and one account manager working on the contract now as guards and an account manager, and you win that contract, you will need to transfer, employ those staff from the current supplier who has lost the contract onto your payroll. 
Now, there'll be lots of questions around this, and it's really important that you do get advice about 2P because 2P is a legal process. So you have to transfer those people that are currently doing the job if they want to transfer. They don't, you don't have to drag them, but if they want to keep their job doing what they've been doing for the last five years and you win the contract and their current company loses it, you have to take them on. And that is the same if it's cleaners, if it's security guards, you know, it can be, a, it really does um, cover a lot of contracts and the the council will tell you in the tender documents if 2p applies 2p will apply and they will even give you information about the current people that are working on the contract can't give you their names because of confidentiality reasons during the tender process but they can tell you how long they've worked there their holiday their sickness and thing pensions and things like that OK, so again, I'm sure there's going to be some questions about 2P, certainly if you are in the service industry. But if you are going for a tender, you need to understand that it can be a really good thing because you've got a ready made workforce that if you win the contract, you've got a ready made workforce that know the job that have been doing it for five years. So it can be a really positive thing uh, 2P as well. But you have to protect those people. OK, moving on. The next one, SLA and KPI, there's some nice jargon for you. These are basically um, perf ways that the council or, or, or the hospital or whoever it is that you are tendering for and hoping to win the work with will measure how well you are performing on the contract. So when you've written your tender um, and you've won that contract, um, you, they will put an SLA in place, which stands for Service Level Agreement, SLA, Service Level Agreement. And that is in, it, it basically in detail what you have to deliver on the contract and how you're going to deliver it at what time scale to, uh, uh, and, the uh, uh, and the quality targets will be the K. PIs, which stands for key performance indicators. And what a key performance indicator is, it is a, it's a target that you, you have to reach in order that the council or the hospital or whoever it is you're supplying knows you're doing delivering the contract correctly. So it might be, for example, you might have a key performance indicator on response times or yeah, call out, emergency call out time. Just say that you're an electrical company or a gas servicing company and you've won a contract. They will put a one hour emergency call out. So if there's an emergency call out, you have to be on site within one hour and they will measure you on that. And how many times were you there in one hour and how many times were you there in an hour and a half? And they will put a target on it. They will say 90% of the time you have to be there in within one hour. OK, um, they might put um, a key performance indicator, a KPI in target for customer satisfaction. You know, when you can conduct your annual surveys, you must um, meet 70 percent customer satisfaction reaching good or above. That could be a key performance indicator. But you have you will have to work to performance targets because obviously the public sector, if they give you a contract, they have to make sure that you are running it correctly, that you are delivering quality services and they need to know that you're monitoring that. So that's how your service level agreement and your key performance indicators come in. And quite often when you are writing tenders, you will need to actually say, you know, we are confident we will meet all your key performance target indicate targets and we can exceed them. You've just asked us to be on site within two hours. We can be in, on site within 30 minutes because we're a local company. So sometimes, again, it's really positive for you, but you need to be aware of what they are. 
Okay, another one, market engagement events. You will quite often see on Newham's website, you will see um, flyers coming around, you'll see email um, coming around about market engagement events. And what these are is when the council, it's before the tender. The council is looking to buy, looking at, looking to go out to with a tender later on, maybe in that year, and they are scoping the market and they're going, who's out there? What kind of um, service can we achieve? What kind of products do we need to be buying and they're holding events and they're asking you to fill in questionnaires you need to be part of that market engagement right from the beginning if you want to win the tender at the end of it when it comes out later in the year so don't ignore market engagement events get on them at all or market engagement questionnaires make sure you get involved right from the beginning and answer their questions You'll also see the term self-certify quite a lot. And what basically that means is in the olden days, um, when I first got into writing tenders um, a long time ago, when we um, sent a tender in and we did literally have to print it off and bind it and send it in in a brown envelope. Um, in those days, we used to have to send every policy we had, every procedure, every certificate. We had to send all our insurance. We had to send three years printed financial accounts. Now you don't need to do that. You self-certify in your SQ, remember, supplier questionnaire. You self-certify that you've got all these things. You don't have to send them into the council until you're the winning bidder and you're awarded a place on the framework and then you do have to send them in, but not during the tender process. OK, and then the last one on my jargon list there is um, e-portals and I should say as well, e-portals and e-procurement. E I just said in the good old days and we used to um, get it, we would get a tender document, we would complete it all, we would print it all in six hard copies, killing I don't know how many trees. We would then bind it all together and then we would literally have to hand deliver it into the council or in a brown envelope. That's how it used to work. It doesn't work like that anymore. Thank goodness, save the trees. It's all on e-portals because all public sector has moved to e-procurement. People get really, really confused by e-portals. And again, I could spend the next three hours talking to you about how to use an e-portal and what to do and what not to do. I haven't got that time, but I am. I have. We have prepared for you, which you will get straight after the training. This handout. Now, this handout will be sent to you after the training. So you, if you stay on the training all the time and it is basically called hints and tips for using e-portals and it tells you all loads of good advice and how to navigate those e-portals on where to find the questions and answers and how to upload your documents and how to download your documents and what to do with them. It's brilliant, this handout. It's double-sided and it is just packed with information to help you find your way around e-portals. At the top of the handout, there is a, um, a link and you will have this electronically, so you will be able to click on this link and that will take you to YouTube. And that will take you to the London Borough of Newham's YouTube clip on how to use their e-portal, which is called Fusion. And I do know that Fusion causes a lot of you a lot of problems and you get confused by it and you don't understand it and you can't find your way around it. Some of you can't even find where the documents are. Then you don't know how to upload them. You don't know what you do need to fill in and it can be really confusing. So that link to that YouTube video is brilliant. So use that and go and find it and then read these tips. Yeah. And also, so there's two really, really, really big things about e-portals. One, don't be scared of them. Three, actually. One, don't be scared of them. Two, don't expect that, don't think you're stupid because you can't find your way around them. You're not. Yeah, there are loads and loads of different e-portals. New Amused Fusion. A lot of the London boroughs use capital e-sourcing. There's lots of other e-portals like Intend, uh, Pro Contract, Delta, the NHS uses Bravo. They're all different. 
So don't expect to be able to just go on an e-portal and know what you're doing. You won't, but you do need to find your way around. Don't be scared of them. And the other key, key, key learning point with e-portals is every e-portal will have a technical helpline. Now that technical helpline is not the council. It's somebody in tech that will tell you and help you. Just by asking that technical helpline and admitting that you don't know how to use the portal and you're confused, doesn't mean you're not gonna get the tender. It's got nothing to do with it. So if there will be a technical helpline on every e-portal that you use, use it. Ask questions, go on the live chat with them. Whatever you need to do to make sure that you understand how that portal works, do it. Yeah, don't let, don't write a brilliant tender and then fail because you didn't know how to upload it or you didn't know where the questions and answers were. So you didn't check them. Yeah, so please don't be scared of them. Don't think you're stupid because you can't get your head around them. Read this handout when you get it. Go on the link on YouTube and you know, and ask questions. And that's the best thing I can say about um, e-portals. But honestly, they are absolutely loads of different ones. Andrea, is this a good time to answer some of the questions that have come through? I can read them out and then you could possibly provide an answer if you're able to. Um, it's just it's just having me the, having the time to read them all. Um, and uh, no, I, I can read them out to you. Um, I've got them all ready. Uh, okay, I'm very, yeah, okay, I've probably got about five minutes, and, I, and so if you can start, and then I'll have to wash some of them up at the end, or we'll have to get back to Yeah, people. no problem, yeah, so Carol wants to know, what evidence can you produce if you are a new company? Okay, I will cover that as we go through the workshop, I've got a whole section on references and what you do if you haven't got any references, so I'll be covering that. Okay, uh, Bashir wants to know, does one person company still count as an SME and can submit a calendar? Yeah, you would actually class as a micro company, which again is in the same category. Micro companies can win tenders. I am writing tenders for companies all over the UK every single day of, of every week um, and every day, seven days a week. That's what it feels like. And I am winning lots of contracts for micro businesses, one person companies. You know, I've got a lot of companies that there is only one person employed, but they use lots of subcontractors or associates that they bring on to help them complete the works. I will be covering subcontractors as I go through and I will tell you how to work if you are one person company using subcontractors. So yes, you can still win contract, but you've got to pick the right tenders. And we're going to do a whole section shortly on what's the right tender for you and how do you pick it? Uh, Nassim wants to know if I'm a current supplier not successful with the upcoming DPS tender, does this mean I will need to move all residents out before reapplying or does it mean residents can stay whilst the open DPS remains open to reapplying? So maybe that's a technical question for our um, procurement team. I can probably answer that, but I need to read it again because I didn't catch it all. So um, ju just give me, ju just uh, let me let me come back to that one. Don't no lose. I'll come back to that one, and I will answer that one uh, because I do know a lot about DPSs. But I will answer it. I just I just need to you know process it. <laughs> you know what no, I mean? No problem. Uh, Anonymous asked, "Are you able to supply a list of portals?" I think you just answered that because you're going to provide the handout, correct? With our fusion. Yes, the handout I've just talk, talked about, yeah, there's a link on the very top of it, which takes you to Fusion YouTube video. And then another anonymous, what is the process for joining Newham Council's preferred supplier list? Um, you're going to have to take that to, I'm going to have to throw that back to Newham Council. Yeah, that would be for I'm our talking about for specific opportunities. Preferred supplier lists can now be classed as framework agreements where they have a, a group of preferred suppliers that have passed the capability and competence tender. So they're on the framework. They, they are then preferred supplier. But I'm going to have to get someone at Newham to, because obviously I don't know Newham's procurement. No problem. And then Isosa. So TP is uh, taking on some other companies' staff. Where did they, where they stop the work? I think they're just asking a clarification on that. Sorry, I haven't got that one. Two P's what, sorry? So two P is taking on some other company's staff where they stopped the work. 
Maybe they misunderstood what 2P meant. Okay, yeah, 2P is, uh, 2P is where you have tendered, you have completed and submitted a tender for a services contract. There is a company currently in there and have been in there for five years. They have not won. They have not been re-awarded that contract because you've written a better tender and you've won it. You have to take on their staff that are currently doing that job in the, uh, providing those services if those staff want to come and work for you, which they normally do because they've been doing that job for five years. So it's a legal process. You have to take them on if 2P applies in the tender and it will tell you that in your documentation. Uh, I think that's all for now. And then if there's any more... Um... Okay, well, I will come back to um, I will come back to that other one as well uh, about DPS, but I'll just have to do that when we have a break. Okay, if you, if you yeah, don't. yeah, no problem. Okay, so there is a handout to go with that slide, and you will get sent all these after the course, obviously. So, um, okay, so don't run away at this point, please, please stay with me. However, um, it is reality that um, when you are um, engaging and, uh, and completing public sector tenders, they do want you to have quite a lot of poli in the way of policies and procedures they do um, need that now why do they need that it's quite simple it's not because they want to make you do loads and loads of work and spend loads and loads of money that isn't the reason um a council any public sector body when they are buying supplies or services or having something built if it's works and construction they are spending public money in a nutshell they are spending public money, so they have to be ensure that they are spending it with the proper suppliers. So in order to prove that you are capable, competent, ethical, you are the right proper suppliers, you will be asked to have certain policies and procedures. It does depend on what you do. Yeah. If you are... Um, a um, let me think of an example. If you are a grounds maintenance company um, cutting grass, you may not. It may not be mandatory for you to have a data protection um, accreditation because you are outside cutting grass. However. If you are a care company and you are holding details of vulnerable people's addresses, conditions, care plans, that kind of thing, you will be expected to have high levels of data security and accreditation because you need to ensure that that information that you have on those vulnerable people in society and in the community is looked after and does not go um, it isn't available to anybody. So it will very much depend on what your company does as to what policies and procedures you need. Yeah. So you don't need, you won't all need absolutely everything on this uh, on this slide, but you will probably need most of what's on this slide. Um, there is another handout that goes with this slide, which you will be sent, as I said, at the end of the course, and that's got even more on it. You don't all need all of it don't panic you need to you need what's relevant for your industry okay and what the when, the, when you're looking at tenders what you're being asked for but as a general rule all public sector will need to make sure that your organization your business is financially stable and by that, it doesn't mean to say you have to have a £43 million turnover. That is not what I am saying. What I am saying is your company is financially stable. Because if the council is going to go into a contract for three to five years with you, they need to make sure that you are still going to be there and that you're not going to get go, you're not going to be taken to court because you haven't paid any bills because you've got nasty CCJs against your name and you've got lots of credit issues. You can't buy products because you've got no money. You're supply chain won't supply you they've got to make sure that isn't you so they will do a financial check on you now in the olden days there most councils and most public sector bodies used to have to send you accounts in and they'd look at them all and analyze them all and produce some figures they don't do that now they do a credit check on your company 
OK, and they might use Dun & Bradstreet, which is a credit checking agency. They might use Experian. They might use another one, Equifax. There's lots of credit checking agencies that the public sector can use. The most common one is Dun & Bradstreet. And therefore, they will ask you in a tender in the supplier questionnaire, they will ask you to provide your DUNS number, D-U-N-S, DUNS number. Now, this is free. You can all immediately after this call go on and get a DUNS number. So that will be another action point for you if you want to write that down. Get a DUNS number. How do you do that? You go to the Dun and Bradstreet website. When you get your handout, there is a link to Dun & Bradstreet on the electronic version of this. So you can click on it, go, it's free, register your company, and you will be allocated a DUNS number, which will then allow the council to do a credit check on your company to make sure that you don't have anything um, that they consider a risk. OK, you will all need some form of business insurance. Now, this will change because I'm very well aware we've got lots of different companies on the course doing lots of different things. You will all need employers liability insurance. You will all need public liability insurance. Some of you will need professional indemnity insurance. Some of you will need other types of insurance if you're care providers. I'm not going to go into all the different types of insurances because you all do different things. But again, Get hold of a tender document, have a look at the insurances that you are being asked for. Do you have those levels of insurance? You don't necessarily have to have that level of insurance to do the tender, but when you are the winner or when you are an award, awarded a place on the framework, you will then have to increase your insurance if it isn't there already. Do you know how much that costs? make sure you find out because it might be a bit of a shock so you need to make sure can I afford to do this is it worth me doing it is the uplift that it's going to cost me in my insurance am I going to get that back in business so you need to just consider some of these things but you will have to have business insurance and you will have to quote insurance policy numbers and uh, who your brokers are and who the policy plan is with and the dates okay you will then need to have quite a lot of policies and procedures. And this is where I really don't want you to panic because a lot of you won't have all of these. And you, there's more, they're on this list as well. There are lots and lots of places that you can go to get templated policies and procedures, and then you can mold them and tailor them and make them fit for your company. Okay, so there's, there's you only have to put, policies and buy policies and procedures into Google and you'll get lots of companies come up. One of the ones I use is called Business in a Box and they basically send you, they could send you all of those there, disaster recovery, equal opportunities, quality, sustainability. They can send you a template for all of those. Yeah, you have to buy them, but they'll send you them and then you, you tailor them to fit your company. Or a lot of you will be members of governing bodies if you're in the care industry, CQC, if you're in recruitment, you'll be in the REC. If you're in cleaning, you'll be maybe a member of the BICS, the British Institute of Cleaning Sciences. If you're in grounds maintenance, you'll be in BALI, Ballet. Your governing body will have resources. If you're in security, the SIA, you've all got governing bodies. Are you a member? If you are, you're paying to be a member. They will have these kinds of things that you can get your hands on. They will have templated policies and you might be able to get them for free with part of your membership. So make sure you ask for them. So you're all going to need a disaster recovery and business continuity policy. You will need that especially imagine having a pandemic imagine there being a pandemic now you know i've been training for 10 15 years and i've always said yeah you need a disaster recovery and business continuity plan just in case it's a pandemic <laughs> it's not going to happen is it and here we all are yeah so we know it can so you will need a disaster recovery and business continuity policy what does that do it basically tells the council what you will do if there is a pandemic what you will do if your internet is cut off at the mains for the next three weeks and they can't get it fixed what are you going to do if all your telephone lines go down if your fleet of vehicles all gets destroyed if your depot or your warehouse burns down you can't, if you've got a contract with the public sector, say, oh, um, we've had a fire, uh, we, we're not going to be able to look after you for six months, but we'll be back in six months. 
they will cut you some slack of course they will they will allow you to get back on your feet but you've got to have a continuity plan you've got to have where can I go? Where can I operate out of? Have I got another office? Can I go somewhere else? You've got to have some continuity in place. You will all need equal opportunity and diversity policies. Again, absolute must, yeah. You will all need quality policies to say how you are managing the quality of what you do, whether you're supplying products, supplies, whether you're, um, supply, uh, whether you're supplying services. How do you manage your quality? Who's in charge of quality in your company? How do you manage it? How do you monitor it? How do you know that your customers are getting a good service from you? Do you do survey? Do you monitor it? How are you managing and monitoring your quality? You will all need some form of sustainability and environmental policy. Depending on what you do, you will need a much bigger one than some of you. If you're an office-based company like I am, I write tenders. I have very, 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 very small environmental impact. So I have an environmental policy which is about three pages long, two pages long probably. Um, some of my clients have environmental management systems which are 200 pages long because they're in manufacturing, they're dealing with chemicals, there's spillages issues, there's gas, there's emissions, there's all sorts of stuff going on so it depends on what you do okay so you might it might not be a major thing for you you will need to have social value or corporate social responsibility policy and or plan to say how you will help the local community what you do in the local community where you will be and uh, whether you uh, you are employing local people and what your plans are for the next year to employ local people apprentices offer work experience offer training um you know what you are doing voluntary wise in the local community as a company you know do you do volunteer hours what charities are you supporting in the local area Area, all that kind of thing will be in your social value uh, plan. And um, it's a legal requirement to have a health and safety policy if you have more than five employees. Okay, if you have less than five, it's also pretty good best practice to have a health and safety policy. Yeah, it means that you are looking after your employees, you have thought about their risks, risks to their health and safety, and also depending on what you do, risks to the public's health and safety if you're working in public buildings or in other people's houses. So you will need a health and safety policy. You might need a lot more than that, depending on what you do. You might need risk assessments and method statements. You might need accreditations to health and safety. It depends on what you do, okay, as to how much health and safety information you're going to need. And um, Newham, and as, as with many of the London boroughs, are very, very, very uh, aware of modern slavery and they are looking for suppliers to, 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 to join them with this, this crusade about modern slavery. Yeah, and, and, and we're going to cover that in a little bit more detail um, later, but um, you need to be on board with modern slavery. And there's a whole big section on Newham's website um, about modern slavery and how, you know, you can uh, actually get on board with that. And, and be um you know uh, uh, you know things like paying the london living wage being um you know a a, a, a dis disability confident um, employer lots and lots of things no exploitation all this kind of thing there's lots of stuff you can work on and we'll talk about it a little bit more later but they will want you on board with that and then as i said earlier data protection data protection is really really key depending on what you do. You can imagine as a tender writing company, if my data protection wasn't high and I'm finding out everything there is to know about all my clients there, everything about who they work with, what they do, their staff, their finances, everything. And if I didn't keep my data secure, I wouldn't have any clients. So data security and data protection is really important to me. It depends what you do, but you will be expected to have a policy about data protection and data security. You know, you will be expected to um, have a GDPR policy, yeah? staff data protection, confidentiality of information that your staff see and find it all covered in that data security and data protection area. So you will all know your business, you will all know what's important, but you have to think of it as a risk to the council. So they are always thinking what could go wrong, health and safety accidents, yeah quality, poor performance, disaster recovery, what happens if all your staff are sick and you can't look after me? Data protection, what happens if you lose valuable information about 62 of our vulnerable people in the borough? They're always thinking of risks and it's your job as, as, as the writer of this tender that you wanna to win to 
mitigate all those risks that the council might have about whether you're it's going to be you're going to be a good company you've got to prove that you are and you've got policies in place and you've got procedures in place and some of you might want to go further and some of you might already have external accreditations around all these areas and a lot of external accreditations come under the ISO certification and ISO stands for international standards now basically you can get an ISO in all of those areas pretty much the most common ones are quality you can apply for an ISO 9001 accreditation which basically means that everything that you do within your business you have a standard operating procedure for and you do it the same way to the same standard and it's monitored and that through all everything that you do in your business from recruiting to ordering to invoicing to customer surveys everything is done to a standard process and you can get an ISO 9001 and I'm not going to say you have to have it because you don't have to have it to win public sector work but the public sector like to see companies with it because it mitigates their risk in that quality area they go oh okay they've been externally accredited they've got these processes in place and they're getting checked every year so yeah that that's a good thing for me and um, so it might be one of something that you want to look at depending on what you do you can get an iso certification for environmental for health and safety for data protection so you can actually, as well as having your own internal, you can go an extra step and get external accreditation. But obviously, they cost money. So it might be worth having a chat with somebody about, is it worth it? Would it help? And if you get a chance to meet any new and procurement people or speak to new and procurement people, say, you know, is it worth me getting an ISO 9001 for quality? Would that help me? Would that give me a better chance? Ask them these questions. I tend to find it does but they are quite expensive, so you need to weigh that up, okay? You will need to have information about your staff, and if, I think somebody's asked a question, there's only one of them in the company. Well, that's it, because you know everything about yourself. That's great, but if you're using subcontractors or associates to help you deliver work, you need to know everything about them, everything. Their experience, their qualifications, their training, their relevant um obviously a history to do with the job that you they're doing for you you need to build up cvs or profiles on them you will have to talk about the people that are going to deliver the contract when you write a tender okay it's really really important that you say this is the team that are going to deliver it this is their experience these are their qualifications this is the previous experience of running and working on similar contracts you're going to have to do that so you have to have that information before you go out to tender because if you've got to get all this together and write a tender you're going to run out of time so this is where you at the top of that slide it says get your business fit to submit and you're getting yourself ready okay you are all going to need to be able to show that you've got previous experience of delivering. Now, I know there will be very new companies on the course that might have only just set up and you haven't got references or case studies or testimonials from clients that you're delivering similar work to at the moment. But if you've just set a business up, I would imagine you've done this work before so you can get case studies on what you've done you can get references about you what you delivered to other people maybe in a previous life before you set your own business up but you need to have something to back up because if you're if i'm the council and i'm looking at your company and you can't give me any evidence of ever ever delivering any work like this before that's going to be a bit of a concern to me. Uh, and I'm going to be thinking, can you do it if you can't, if you've never done it before? So you are going to need to have some references and case studies and ideally testimonials. So depending on what kind of business you are and what you do and how long you've been established, if you have been established a while, you need to go out to people that you are supplying your services or your products, or the thing if you're in construction that you built things, you know, built buildings or done maintenance for and go, can I use you as a referee if I go for a new piece of work? Can I use your name and your email address and your contact details? Great. Can I write something about what I did for you? And can you 
uh, and send it to you. And will you let me know if that's okay for me to use as a reference? OK, so you've got to have these kind of things because your competitors will have them. Um, and if they're, they're providing four or five fabulous five star references and you haven't got any, again, they are going to look better than you. Now, a lot of you will be on, depending on what you do, you might be on Trustpilot, you might be on Checker, Checker Trade, you might at .com, I nearly sang, I did sing it, CheckerTrade.com, and um, you might be on Trustpilot, you might be on Glassdoor, there's lots of different review sites, again, depending on what type of work you do and what business you're in. But if you've got good reviews, screenshot them and you can save them and then we can use them in the tender as a picture or a screenshot or use the words because it's all backup evidence to prove that you can do what you say you can do and that's what it's all about okay you're also going to need some performance statistics now i've explained what kpis are key performance indicators so it's not enough for you to say in your tender when you want to try and win a piece of work we're really good at doing this and we've done it loads before because that's not really going to be good enough you need to say we have delivered this type of work for the last two years we've delivered it to 16 people of those 16 people 95 percent of them were said we were excellent and the, the other five said we were good we delivered 100 percent of the work on time we responded to all call outs within the time time you know the two hour slot 100% of the time. These are kind of statistics that you're going to need. So you need to be having a look back at what you've been doing and getting some statistics together, okay? With numbers, not lots. Lots of the time we do a good job. That's not a quantified measurement. So we need to have some performance. How good are you? Because I bet you're brilliant at what you do, but you need to tell me how brilliant you are. And that's those figures, 98% of the time, 100% of the time, yeah, you need to give me some statistics. And if you are members of industry bodies, uh, you've got membership of your governing body, of your industry body, make sure you've got the certificate, make sure it's in date. And if you have ever gone for any business awards or Chamber of Commerce award, and you've won an award for customer service or professional services, or again, make sure you've got all that information handy because you're going to be using that because yeah, that is all selling how good you are and shouting about how brilliant your company is, yeah? And that's what we need to do. We can't be modest. There's no room for modesty in a tender process. You can't sit there and go, oh, I won't say that because that makes me look big-headed. Uh-uh, shout about it. Tell everybody how brilliant you are. You're in a competition to win, okay? So what I would suggest, another little action point for you all here is to get lots of folders set up on your computer um, with health and safety on one, environmental on the other, um, disaster recovery on another, staff information on another, performance on another, and then start to find things, scan things, take photos of things, create things, get put figures together and start to drop them into the folders that they go in. Get all your policies and procedures, get them in. Get your certificates if you've got any certificates for your engineers in gas safe or NIC, EIC if they're electricians or if they're domiciliary carers and they've got all their NVQs. Get certificates, get photographs, scan the certificates and drop them in those folders so you've got everything ready. There is never enough time when you do a tender to, um, to get the tender written and get everything done. So if you can get yourself fit to submit, and if you're serious about winning business, have all these folders with everything in it, it'll be a much more organised process when you come to do your tender, not a, ah, pull my hair out, run around like a headless chicken going, I haven't got that, I need that, I need that, I need that, and it's all trying to, it's all going mad. So try and be organised. Okay. All right. Really, we are going to have a break shortly. Um, I have got a break planned in. Um, we've got another, this slide, one more, and then we're going to have a quick break. So just bear with me for two more slides and we'll have a short 10 minute break because I'm absolutely dying for a cup of tea. So um, not every tender will be opportunity that comes out from Newham or from other public sector bodies will be right for your business, but there will be some that are right. You need to find the ones that are right for you. So you need to be able to, when a tender 
opportunity is advertised and that will be advertised on all sorts of different places and we can get that information in the chat for you and there's find a tender which is a government um, advertising new and advertise all their own tenders on their website there's lots of different places you can find tender opportunities yeah but they're not all going to be right for you and i'm not going to lie you're not going to be able to do all the tenders that are out there because you won't have time because i would imagine most of you don't just sit there and wait for a tender to come in and that's the only job that you've got most of you will have about six different hats you've got to run the company you've got to do marketing you've got to do business generation you've got to go to events you've got to pay people you've got you've got all sorts to do as well as write this tender when it comes in so picking the right ones is really important so to write a winning tender it does take time and it does take resource you've got to commit to it you've got to get somebody to write it or you've got to write it therefore you've got to give your time up you've got to lock yourself away so if you've got several other jobs to do or you haven't got or you're not a large company which i'm sure many of you aren't you need to be selective and just pick the ones that you've really got a good chance of winning so when you see a tender opportunity you need to get this slide out when you you'll be sent all these slides you need to get this slide out and you need to look at that tender opportunity and you need to ask yourself all those questions in the boxes and the most important ones are on the top row then down to the middle and then down to the bottom row you need to ask yourself do we pass all the mandatory criteria and we'll go through what mandatory criteria is after we've had a break can you pass all the passes because if you can't, you fail and you're out and there's no going back. So you've got to be able to pass it all. Do we have the capability to deliver what the buyer wants? So the buyer will send you a document with all the tender documents called specification or scope of works. And in that document, it will tell you what the buyer, so what newer want you to deliver if you are successful. What you have to deliver, when you have to deliver it, how you have to deliver it, to what standard you have to deliver it, using what products, what equipment, etc. They will tell you all of that. You have to read that specification and go, yes, we can definitely deliver all of that. Or we can deliver most of that, but we'll have to subcontract a couple of bits out. But that's not a problem because we can subcontract to Jim, John and Sally. That's what you need to do to make sure, because if you can't deliver the spec, don't tender. Can we evidence similar projects or work? And have we got references from either your history, historical, to prove that you can deliver this contract? Or are we working on similar jobs now, similar projects, similar contracts that so we can go, look, this we can prove that we can deliver your work new and because we're doing it for so-and-so, or we have done it, or I have done it for so-and-so before, okay? Have you read those T's and C's? Remember, terms and conditions. Newham or whoever it is that you're tendering for will send you their terms and conditions. Have you read them? Can you work to them? Because if it's all, can't do that, 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 won't do that, really don't like the look of that, I'm not prepared to do that, don't tender. Because most terms and conditions won't be changed and they are binding, yeah? So if you win the contract, you have to work to the council's terms and conditions and so make sure you can massive one will it give you a return on investment are you going to make money if you win this contract because not all public sector contracts are the bucket of gold at the end of the rainbow there's lots of reason people win public sector work it's secure it's stable there's lots of it it's good business to have. It looks fabulous on your portfolio to say, we are a supplier to the London Borough of Newham. That looks brilliant on your portfolio because then when you go for another London Borough or you go for another public sector contract, they go, oh, wow, look, they've got the London Borough of Newham. That means they must be capable and competent and they've passed the tender. That's brilliant. So there's lots of real positive, but you don't always get the best margin as in profit margin on, on uh, public sector work. But you've got to make sure, how much effort will we need to put in to run this contract? Will, will it give us what we want out of it? And if it does, that's great. You might not be going in to win a tender with a public sector to make millions of pounds. You might be going into it to get a public sector contract on your books, to get that 
first contracts here that then that will open doors for you to be able to supply other public sector and then therefore you're not looking to make a massive amount of money but you need to make some profit can we deliver what the client wants and remember they told you what they want in their specification or scope of work you need to read that spec and say can do have we got the right staff is it geographically in the right area can we do it on time can we meet their response times can we actually move get this contract up and running when they want us to yeah really important one who is the competition who's got the contract now and a lot of you today are service companies and if it's a services tender as i said earlier every five years generally doesn't matter how brilliant the company's done that's run that's got the tender now it has to go back out for tender which is great if you haven't got it now because you've got a chance to get in but you, if you haven't got it now, you need to find out who has. And you can find that out from the council it's on the Newham website, if it's Newham. It tells you who all their current suppliers are of everything that they do. And it also tells you when the contract's back up for renewal. Brilliant stuff. Newham are really, really good with this kind of information. And I'll show you where to get that information later. Do you, have you got any existing relationships with the person you're trying to win business with? So if you're trying to win a, a, a contract with Newham, have you ever spoken to Newham? Do you know Newham? Do they know anything about you? Have you been to any events with them? Have you met them? You're all on this course today. So that's brilliant because you've already made that first step of, of getting your company involved with working with Newham. So that's really, really good. Um, and have you got the right resources available to write that tender? Because it can be quite a time consuming job. So make sure that you can. You're not going to say, yeah, we'll go. We'll go for this and then leave it till two days before the tender's got to be in and then realise you've got 20 questions to answer and they've all got a thousand words. That's when you might fall foul. So make sure you understand how much work is involved and can you get it done in time? OK, so one more slide and then we're having a break. OK, so. The first stage of any tender process is to complete the SQ, which I said earlier was a supplier questionnaire, all about your company, what you do, who does it, all these questions, how many staff have you got, um, what's your finances, what's your insurance, all this kind of thing. But what we've got to remember is when, let's just say Newham Council have got a tender out and you're filling in an SQ, what Newham Council are doing when they look at your SQ that you filled in is they're going, I'm conducting a risk assessment on whether this company are capable and competent to supply me. Are they financially sound? Have they got the right policies and procedures? You know, you know, um, is there any risk of, you know, any issues with modern slavery? Is there, um, you know, are, do, do they have previous experience so they're asking they're asking you the questions because they want to make sure that you are capable and competent to deliver and the first stage has got nothing to do with price nothing at all you've got to get through the first stage first and that first stage is is your company fit morally ethically financially to be a supplier to the public sector. And that's why you need all those policies and things that we looked at. So it is Newham conducting a risk assessment on you. And it's your job to prove that your company, yes, we are capable, we are competent, and we should be shortlisted through this first stage to get to the next stage. Because once you've got through this first stage, you then get to the bit where you get to put your prices in and tell them all about how fabulous you are. But if you don't get through this first bit, you don't even get there. OK, so we're going to carry on where we left off after a break. We're going to take only 10 minutes. And I'm so sorry that it's only 10 minutes. But we're, um, if we can come back at half past 11, please don't go offline, please. Just drop your cameras. There's nobody got their cameras on, I don't think, but only Julia. Thank you, Julia. Um, I can see somebody. Um, so don't drop your cat. Uh, don't go offline. Just come back. Go and get yourself a cup of tea. Uh, check your phones. Have a comfort break. And I'll see you back here at half past. Any questions, pop them in the chat. Thank you. See you at half past.
Hello. Do we have people back? I don't know. I can't see anybody. It's really sad. I can only see Julia, which is nice. And I'm glad I can see you, Julia. <laughs> Nobody else wants to put their cameras on. Just have another quick swig of tea and then uh, we'll give it another minute just in case people are, uh, are not back at their desk. I hope it's all going OK so far. Oh, hi. You can see you back now as well. Yeah. Oh, yeah. We've got lots of thumbs to say that we're back. Hello again from Jan. Hi, Jan. Hi, Zoe. Hi. It's so nice to see people are out there. Lovely. And already lots of positive comments. So that's brilliant. Thank you for those. I'm glad it's going uh, well so far. So, um. I'm just quickly going to wash up a few questions. And Raj, if I missed any, will you just let me know, please? So um, somebody yeah, just wanted to Dunn's number. I did cover that. I don't know whether you missed it. It's Dunn and Bradstreet, and it's a credit check. It allows the council or the public sector to do a credit check on your company. Now, after the, people have also asked, are we sending the slides out? Yes, we are sending all the slides out after the call and the handouts. I did mention there was a checklist handout with all the policies and procedures and things you need. The Dun and Bradstreet link to get your Dun's number is on that handout, which you will get after the course. So um, that covered that one. Yes, you'll get the slide. Somebody's asked me a brilliant question, and we've only been we've been established less than three years. Can we still bid? Yes, you can. Um, we'll come to a little bit shortly um, about references and how we fill in that reference section. And if you haven't got three references or you're you know, relatively new, how, what we do. But yes, you can still bid. It will depend the size of the bid, though. So we've just looked at bid or no bid, go or no go. And I was just saying, don't think that you're going to win everything. You've got to go for opportunities that are realistic to the size and the age of your company. So if there's a, um, you know, a £250 million bid uh, opportunity and you've only been going a year and you've only got two staff, it's probably not realistic that you're going to win it. So just have a look at the, um, you know, the opportunity. If it's a framework, remember... There'll be more than one supplier on that framework, probably. So that's a really good opportunity for you to get on if you're a relatively new company. But you will still have to pass all these financial checks and, and all the pass-fail mandatory criteria, remember. You can't get around that. doesn't matter how new you are. You will have to be at a... You will have to be not a risk. OK, so make sure that you can do that. But they used to ask for three years financial accounts. They don't do that now as a general rule. They just want a credit rating on your company, and that's a positive credit rating. So find out who they're using to do their credit rating and make sure that your credit rating with... It could be Dun & Bradstreet, it could be Experian, it could be Equifax. Find out who they're using and make sure your credit rating is positive and you can find out yourself by going online so you can do that. Um, I have been asked about community, a bit of a community wealth building by somebody. Um, I'm not going directly into Newham's community wealth building today, but I am going to cover social value and that it links in with it. And because social value is what? What can you give back to the community if they if the council or the hospital give you a tender a contract money basically what can you give them back and how do we write about that so i am going to cover that so hopefully that will be that one um and somebody's asked can private companies bid well yeah i would say 95 percent of the people on this workshop and we've got 137 will all work for private sector companies that are bidding to win public sector work OK, the public sector does bid to win other public sector work, but the majority of tendering is private sector companies like me, like most of you, bidding or tendering to win public sector contracts. OK, so, yeah, we're all pretty much private companies here. So, yeah, you're in you're in good crowd. We're all private sector companies trying to win this 
this lucrative and, and, and brilliant, really, uh, public sector work that there is out there. OK, now there were a couple of questions about the DPS framework, and I have, I have asked the organisers of the course and knew them to pass that through to procurement, and they will get back to you on those, because one of the questions was you were, you're currently supplying on a framework, and, and I'm obviously I don't work for the London Borough of Newham, so they are going to come back to you directly on those, um, and hopefully they will be able to answer your direct questions if you are already ready a supplier to new them okay so any more questions and i can just see that the chat's already gone up so uh, i'm gonna uh, check it shortly or if there's anything that i've missed um i'm sure one of the all, all fabulous organizing team that's supporting me today will um uh, will interrupt me and uh, uh, and ask any questions if they need to so okay right well we'll crack on so we're gonna look now at a standard now this is a little bit small so you'll all be like this now like me i'll all be like this really close up to the screen so hopefully you can in you're not you're not trying to do this on a phone because you might struggle at this point couldn't get this any any bigger really um the sq remember that supplier questionnaire and they are standardized so this is good news for you because once you've filled in one you pretty much use it time and time and time again. You can copy it over and it's the same information. It's standard information about your company. OK, but you need to read everything. Now, one of the well, the two biggest reasons companies fail in tendering or fail to win, fail to get a place on a framework, fail to win a tender. Two main reasons. One, they don't read everything, or they don't read enough, or they don't read half of it, or they don't read any of it. And the second one is they don't give it enough time. They don't give completing the tender enough time. And um, they don't realise the, the enormity of some of tenders. They're not all massive, but some of them are quite big. So it's time and it's reading. And I say to all my tender writers through that wall there, and they're fed up of me banging on about it, I'll say a good tender writer is somebody that can read and read everything. We can all read, but how much do we read? And you've got to read everything. And that's and you just look at this one slide. Please answer the following. This is at the top. Please answer the following questions in full. Note that every organisation that is being relaxed um, relied on to meet the selection must complete and submit the part one and part two self-declaration straight away it's saying you have to complete part one and part two and therefore you have to in that response column fill it in if it's not applicable you have to put n a not applicable don't leave it blank because then they go oh, did you mean to fill it in and not did you forget did you go, we're going to go back and fill it in and then forgot or no. So if it's not applicable, N, A. OK, if it's yes or no, you've got to pick one. You can't put, you know, leave it. You've got to pick yes or no. So obviously it starts off really basic. What's the name of your company? You'll all know that. What's your registered office address? If you are a registered company, you won't all be registered company. Don't panic. It says there, if applicable, you don't have to be registered. But if you are, you need to give your registered office, your registered website address and your trading status. Now, your trading status. You should know what you are. You are public limited. Most of you will just be limited companies or sole traders, sole traders, limited companies. You, we might have some third sector organisations in with us today or some social enterprise organisations, which would be brilliant if we have. You, then you'd go other, your third or third sector. If you're sole traders, you need to clearly stay in that box response, F, so, uh, E, sole trader. Or if you're a limited company, B, limited company. OK, so fill it in exactly as they've asked you. Yeah, don't make up some other weird and wonderful trading status. Um, date of registration, if you're a registered company, if you're not, not applicable. OK, never leave it blank. Again, um, charity registration number, if you're a charity, head office, DUNS number. There you go. There's that thing I've just been talking about. DUNS number is your Dun and Bradstreet registration number, which is free for you to get. All you have to do is go on to the Dun and Bradstreet website. The link's on the handout you'll get later and register your company and you'll get a number. 
And that's what number that you put in there. And that's how the council do a financial check on you. OK, that number, if you registered, it might be not applicable, not applicable if that's the case. Yeah. And then if you're if applicable, again, is your organisation registered with the appropriate professional trade registers in the member state where it is established? Yes. Yeah, if you're a C, CQC registered, if you're in recruitment and you're REC, if you're in um, security and you're SIA, yes, you are registered. So give it a big yes. OK, tick yes. Make it really clear. Don't tick both boxes or underline one and not do anything. Make it very clear whether it's a yes or a no, because these could be pass or fail. These ones aren't because they're if applicable, but as we move on further, they will be pass or fail. And there's lots of other questions there about your business. Now, everybody's business on this um, webinar today is different. So I'm not gonna go through every single line, but um, you just need to read it. And you know what? If you read it and it doesn't make sense, ask a question. You would have downloaded, if it's new one, you will have downloaded these documents, this document that we're looking at, you will have downloaded from the Fusion portal. If you don't understand what question 1.1 in brackets, I, I can't even read that to Jay, I can't even read that, my eyes are going funny. Copy the question, go onto the Fusion portal, it, find where you can ask a, ask a question and say, can you please clarify what information you want from me for this question, bang. Because if you don't understand it, the council don't want you to do it wrong. Trust me, the council want you to fill all this in correctly. But if you don't understand it, you might not know what to put. So ask a question if you don't understand. There you are at the bottom. Are you a small, medium or micro enterprise, yes or no? told you it's positive they want to know they want to use small medium and micro businesses so um, if you are make sure you put a big yes in that um, in that box there and um, over on the other side of the slide there at the top it says details of persons of significant control now this is if people have got shares in your company if you own 100 percent of it you need to put your name date of birth and nationality of the, uh, there it does explain it if your wife or your husband owns 50 percent of it you both need to go in there so you'll need if it's not applicable because you know it, it, you're, you're a sole, sole trader and you're not a limited company that's fair enough okay but you need to understand what these things mean and you know what the power of google details of persons of significant control psc put that into google it'll tell you exactly what it all is so don't be afraid if you don't understand the language okay if you have i don't know whether any of you will not probably not many of you will but some of you may have a parent company if you are owned by a parent company in a supplier questionnaire you need to give details of the parent company as well and a lot of my clients that I work for do have parent companies. So we've got to give all those details as well. OK, and look, it says there at the bottom, a criminal record check for relevant convictions may be undertaken for the preferred suppliers and the persons of significant control. So if you've got any directors in your business that own a big chunk of your business and have shares and they have got a criminal record, it might not be um, the best if you want to win a tender with the public sector. OK, just saying it's on there. OK. So the next bit of the SQ is, again, asking more about you. It's basically saying, how are you going to run this contract? Are you, and somebody's already asked me, I think, about subcontractors. So this is a great one. There's only me. Um, are you going to use subcontractors to run the contract? Or associates, you might be a training company, and you are the only person actually full-time employed but you use associate trainers to deliver the training programs when you need them. That is perfectly okay. It is fine to use subcontractors. It is fine to use associates. You don't have to employ everybody full time. The public sector understand why people use subcontractors and associates, yeah? But, there's always a but, but, if you do use subcontractors or associates to deliver the works and you will use them to deliver the works on this contract, you have to declare that you will and you have to provide their details. What you can't do is say, we're going to use subcontractors, but I'm not going to tell you who. Because they're asking. 
basically. If you responded yes, this is at 1.2b at the bottom. Um, if you responded yes to 1.2b, please provide details for each subcontractor in the following table. We may ask them to complete this form as well. So you have to say, if you just say you are uh, bidding for a window cleaning contract and you are going to deliver 80% of the window cleaning requirements your, with your staff, but 20% of the window requirements are for those amazing people that abseil down the outsides of buildings on ropes and clean windows just as Spider-Man because they're at the children's hospital and that kind of thing. If you're going to subcontract that 20% out, you need to be prepared to say the name of the company you're going to subcontract it to, yeah, the role that they're going to play, so they're going to do the abseil high-rise clean, which is about 20% of the work. And you have to fill in that table. Yeah. So it's perfectly okay to use subcontractors, but you have to declare them. So you can't, I mean, I do, I, I do have clients say, oh, I'm not telling them who I'm working with. You might have a bit of a problem winning the contract then because you'll be seen as, that will be a fail. If you're going to say, yes, we're going to use subcontractors, but no, I'm not going to tell you who they are, you'll fail. So you do need to get this information together on your subcontractors and you should have it to be fair. And then you just need to put your contact details and declaration in. And it's, it's your details. It's the person that's filling this form in, the person that needs to be available, then you need to say, where it says electronic signature, people get really stressed about electronic signatures. All you need to do is sign a piece of white paper. Yeah. So you know, basically... Put your signature on a piece of white paper, take a photo of it on your phone, yeah? Send yourself that photo on an email, cut it, crop it, and stick it in there as a picture. That's your signature. That's as easy as it is to do a signature. And the number of people that get really, really worried because they haven't got a software to do an electronic signature, you can put a picture in that box, yeah? Take a photo of your signature on a blank piece of paper, so email it to yourself, crop it, stick it in there as a picture. Totally acceptable. Okay. So this is dead easy so far, isn't it? You're all with me on this. You're thinking, I don't know what she's going on about. This is dead easy. All right. Then we get to a bit. Now, this is in every SQ that you'll complete for the public sector. We get to this bit where it's asking you all questions about have you been dodgy? Right. Now, I'm telling you now, your answer's no to all of these. And if it isn't no, you shouldn't really be tendering. OK, certainly not for public sector business, because basically they are asking you, have you ever taken part in criminal, uh, been part of a criminal organisation, um, corruption, fraud, terrorism, uh, money laundering, child labour? Uh, so you're not going to be answering yes to any of them. You are going to be answering no. OK, so this is mandatory exclusion. So if you look at the top of the slide, where it's just under where it says section two in the blue. Grounds for mandatory exclusion. So if you say, yes, I'm in a criminal organisation. Yes, I'm, I've, I've done a load of corruption. I, yeah, I do fraud every day. And yeah, I've done a few, I've had a few terrorist offences. Yeah, you're probably going to fail. There's a very good chance that you're going to fail. You are going to fail. So just make sure you're reading because believe it or not, people get this wrong and they don't get it wrong because they've done any of that. They get it wrong because they've misread the way it should be, because sometimes they say, um, uh, um, uh, confirm that um, confirm that you have never had any um, corruption or fraud. And then you've got to say yes, because you're confirming that you've never had. In this one, you're saying, you know, that no, you haven't. So you've just got to make sure that you read it to make sure that you tick the right one. And in this case, it's all no's. OK. Um, if it was yes, as you're asked to provide details, if it was yes, you're not going to get through this SQ. So um, it's not going to be. I've never, ever in 20 something years ever worked with a company where I've had to put yes to any of those. Thank goodness. Um, so all of those are no. No, 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 no. All the way down. OK, so nice and easy. This is dead easy, isn't it? You see, it's nothing to be scared of at all. Now you get to next slide and next bit of the SQ and look at where it says section three, grounds for discretionary exclusion. So in the ideal world, all of these need to be no as well. No, 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 no. Just tick the box no all the way down. 
However, some of you, some companies may have been um, liquidated or they may have had directors that have been bankrupt. And that would maybe through no fault of their own. Um, in the Midlands, um, we had when Carillion, which was a huge facilities management and construction company, went into liquidation, they took down so many small businesses with them and they went into liquidation and they went bust because of Carillion. So when those directors managed to get back on their feet and restart a new business, um, they had to declare that they had been bankrupt, they had been liquidated. But when they explained the backup to it because it was because of Carillion, it actually they were fine and they got through these are discretionary so if you have to put yes to one of these it doesn't mean you're automatically going to fail as long as you can back it up with a good reason yeah but in an ideal world i'm going to be honest most of these need to all be no okay and if they are if they aren't no you need to read them all if they aren't no you need to say mm, really am i am i right to be bidding for public sector business remember the public sector is spending public money so they've got to be spending it with companies that are ethical yeah don't have criminal records don't have any um you know criminal activity okay so that's the reason there is a reason behind all of this uh, sometimes it's blinding the way that they ask you the questions don't be afraid of it read it if you don't understand it ask the question on that e-portal please explain what you mean but this is normally for all of us i would imagine going to be nose again all the way down okay so then we get to the bit where they want to know about your financial standing now they're not asking here for your um they're not saying to you, you have to have a turnover of five million. They're not saying that. They're asking for your financial standing. And in this situation, which goes against what I have been saying, they do want you to provide your audited accounts. Please provide a copy of your audited accounts for the last two years. Now, that's not you. Normally, they will be credit checking and it will say, are you able to provide a copy of your accounts? And you just tick, yes, we are able. Um, now, if you haven't been going two years, you need to um, speak to the council about whether you will be accepted or not. Because it says there, if you are not able to provide a copy of your audit account, please answer N and indicate which of the following you have provided to demonstrate your financial standing. So if you can't provide two years. Now, also, don't be freaked out about the word audited accounts. As long as your accounts are professionally pro <laughs> professionally prepared, gosh, that's a mouthful, by an accountant, you don't have to have audited accounts until you're a certain size. So you don't need to worry about that word. That's just used in every SQ at forever, and it always is. Professionally prepared accounts. So if you can provide two lots of accounts for two years, you just tick yes. If you can't, because maybe you haven't been running two years, you've only been running a year, you need to read on. Then you need to provide a statement of turnover, profit and loss, account income, or a statement of cash flow, or alternative means of demonstrating financial status. But if you can supply two years, you don't need to do any of that. It's not applicable because you've supplied the two years. This is where you need to read and read carefully. Because a lot of people will give two years accounts and the statement of turnover, which we all in your accounts anyway, but they'll go on and do a lot more and explain in, you know, in a separate document why they can't do it. You don't need to. If you've got two years, you just tick yes. Okay. Section five. If you have indicated in the selection questionnaire uh, that you are part of a wider group, please provide group details. So that's where if you're part of a group of companies or you've got a parent company, you need to go into their details there and you need to give your parent company accounts. OK, so a lot of you probably won't be part of a parent company, but if you are, you need to read that and you need to make sure you've got your parent company information as well. OK, and then we come on to, for me, probably one, well, if not, if, if not the first, the first or second most important part of this whole SQ. The council, because this is this is a London Borough of Newham document this sq that i have copied off here i've just copied it straight and dropped it onto him is you your chance here to prove your prof 
professional and technical ability. So the, up till now, right? So up till now, everybody will be at the same place, I would imagine. Everybody would have ticked yes where they needed to tick yes, no where they needed to tick no, filled in the first bit. So everybody up to this point is at the same point. Everybody's passed. Because if you're going to say you've got criminal activity, you've failed. So you're not going to do it. You're just not going to fill it in. So everybody up to this stage is there. We're all passed. So this is the first point in this document that we're filling in that you can differentiate yourself from the other 62 people that are filling this form in to make you stand out, make you better, get you put through to the next stage. And a lot of people really let themselves down on this section. This is the reference section. And you need to read really carefully. Please provide details of up to three contracts from either the public or private sector, voluntary charity or social enterprises that are relevant to our requirement. Yeah? In the past five years. So basically what they are asking you to do is say, show me three contracts. They don't have to be tendered contract. Three contracts, three projects, three people that you've delivered the same services that this tender that you want to win is for to in the last five years. So if this is for grounds maintenance, grass cutting, all that kind of thing, you've got to be able to give me ideally it says up to three so you might only be able to give me one or two but ideally up to three grass cutting grounds maintenance hedge cutting weeding contracts that are similar to this contract how do you know what this contract wants you've got their specification so you know what the kind of work involved if you win this contract is you know what you've got to do because you've read that in order to make that bid or no bid decision before you start filling this in so you know what you've got to do so then you've got to think and go right the london borough of newham one hedge cutting grass cutting weeding Blah, blah, blah. Where have I done that before? And who have I done it for? Right, I've done it for so-and-so. I've done it for that hospital. So I'm going to put them down. And first of all, I'm going to contact them and say, can I use you as a referee? If they say yes, I'm going to use contract one, maiden head hospital. Point of contact, John Smith, position in the organisation, um, head of facilities management, his email address, a description of the contract. I'll come back to that. When you started the contract, when you finished the contract, or it might just be an ongoing contract, it's rolling, you just put ongoing contract, and basically the value of the contract, how much does that hospital spend with you every year, and you've got to have that detail, so action point after this workshop, who are you currently supplying to, and get that information, name, point of contact, email address, I'll come back to the description of the contract. When did you start supplying them or doing work for them? When did it finish? And how much roughly did they spend with you? You've got to have that information. You've got to be able to ideally, and I'm talking ideal here. I will tell you, I will answer the question because I know there'll be loads of questions coming in saying, what if we haven't got three contracts? So I will come back to that in a second. But ideally, um, you need to have some projects contracts work that you're delivering that's similar to what you want to win and you need to be able to talk about it okay if you're going to subcontract which we've spoken about it's totally fine to subcontract if you are going to subcontract that 20 percent of that window cleaning out because you you don't hang from ropes on abseil in down buildings you don't do that so you're going to subcontract that out you'd need to answer 6.2 where you intend to subcontract a portion of the contract, please demonstrate how you have previously maintained a healthy supply chain with your subcontractor. And it tells you what evidence they want. They want you to say how, you know, how when do you pay your, your subcontractors, when do you pay your subcontractors, how often, you know, um, have you got a testimony to say that you're great to work with? You know, how uh, you know how often do you meet with them? How do you know that they that, that they're a good company, all that kind of thing. So, but if you're not subcontracting any of it, not applicable but make sure you put in there not applicable if it isn't applicable. 
So this is really important action point for you. Go away and try and sit and scratch your head and go, okay, who do I supply to now? I need to get this information together because you will be asked for it. Now I'm going to go back to the description of the contract. Halfway down that little table there, it says description of contract. Now, if it's a cleaning contract, you do not just put in that box. I know that box looks really small, right? But believe it or not, that box will expand if you start to type in it. So in description of contract, you do not just write cleaning contract. You have to write a little bit more than that. Now, this is another example of a reference table that you'd be asked to fill in. Name of the organisation that you've provided works for, point of contact, start date and completion date and value. And then in no more than 500 words, please provide a brief description of the contract, including evidence as to your capability in this market. So you've got 500 words to write about whoever you're picking, let's just say Maidenhead Hospital for contract one. You've got 500 words to, to write about the YMCA, which is your organisation and contract two that you also cut the grass for. And you've got 500 words to write about your contract three, which might be a primary school that you go and cut the sports fields for. But you've got 500 words for each one. Use them. A winning SQ will really go to town in this description of the contract. Now, in the new one, one that we just looked at, it didn't give a word count, which means you can put as much or as little as you want. But you know what? I'll be putting 500 words and do every time. So use the 500 word description to talk about what did you deliver for that client? How did you deliver it? When did you deliver it? Who delivered it from your organization? How satisfied was the client? Were there any of those KPIs you can quote, key performance indicators? How quickly did you work? Was it on time? Was it on budget? You know, what was the customer satisfaction? Describe in detail what you delivered to each of those contracts. And here's what I mean. Here's one that I filled in, just one. Now, there isn't an airport in Dudley. So you're all down in London. I'm up in the Midlands, but there isn't an airport in Dudley. So please don't turn up to Dudley Airport because there isn't one. I've made it up. But this is just an example, OK, of how much information. That is 500 words, the big bit at the, the bottom, believe it or not. It's 500 words. So I filled in name of organisation, Dudley Airport. Point of contact, name, uh, mobile, email. When I started the contract, when we finished the contract, I've even popped in there that we were so brilliant that we the, the contract was extended. If you're in the services sector, so you're providing security, cleaning, catering, gas servicing, anything in that kind of industry, maintenance services, most contracts you go for with the public sector will initially be um, awarded to you when you've won it for three years. If you do in an exceptional job and everything's going really well, they can extend it for a further two years. Yeah, they don't have to, but they can. So if you've had a contract extended, you've got a contract, you've had it extended, tell me that. Because a really, really good tender writer can win a contract if the price is right and the, and the written co content is all right. But if you've run it for three years and you've had it extended, that's because you've done a fabulous job. So tell me that you've had it extended because that says a lot, that does. And then there you go, there's your 500 words. And that just gives you an idea of what a, a reference description is. That's talking about what you did if you were a cleaning company on that contract. How many staff worked on the contract? What areas of the airport that you cleaned? Um, where, what cleaning duties did you do? How you covered the staff at 24, 7, 3, 6, 5, because it's an airport. A case study of when there was, the airport was snowed in and you had to provide extra cleaning services. Um, you know, security aspects of the contract because it's an airport. Um, added value that you gave to that client. Quality, KPIs. And there's a little table at the bottom which shows you exactly what I mean by KPI. Customer satisfaction. You were targeted by Dudley Airport to do 95% of customers were happy with the cleaning services. Actually, 98% were. It's like when you walk out the toilets at an airport and you've got that 
thing and you hit the smiley face, the green one or the red one or the yellow one. Well, 98% hit the green one. Quality checks were undertaken. You were asked 93%, you delivered 98%. So it's showing that you're actually delivering the contract to a better standard than they wanted you to. That is how you can write 500 words. So it's possible. So have a look at your contract and have a look at what you can write about contracts that you are supplying right now. Okay. Now, some of you won't have any contracts. You'll be new. Well, you won't have three contracts. And it says there, look, underneath, as we go, carry on in, this, in this, this supplier questionnaire, if you cannot provide at least one example in no more than 500 words, please provide an explanation for this. E.g., your organisation is a new startup or you have provided services in the past but not under a contract. That's your opportunity. You've got 500 words in that box. So you put not applicable in the one above, in the reference table, and you fill that in. Now, I worked recently for a gentleman who'd been an operations director or a, a, an operations director for a stationery shop for years and years, uh, for stationery, a national stationery company for years and years and years and years and years. And he left and he set up his own stationery company. He didn't have any contracts because he's only just set up, but he's worked in the stationary supply industry for 30 something years. So we filled this box in about whom him, his contracts, what he's done, his past record, how he'd supplied, who he'd supplied, you know, gave some personal references that they could contact and he got through. So it is possible. OK, but you've got to have a good story. You've got to, if you've just set up a business, what did you do? in your previous life before you set that business up and that's what you need to rely on in that box okay now section seven is modern slavery now as i said um newham um really do want you to have a modern slavery um statement and the policy um you will need this however 7.1 and 7.2 for I would say everybody will be not applicable, um, not applicable to 7.1. Um, and then you haven't answered if you've answered yes. So it's it's not applicable 7.2 either, because you only have to. Are you a relevant commercial organization as defined by Section 54? That's what it's saying at 7.1. If any of you are on the course on this workshop today and your turnover is greater than 36 million, you will need to answer yes to that. But the majority of us will not have a turnover of 36 million, so we will tick not, not applicable, okay, because it is not applicable to us, okay, because we're not a huge organisation. However, yeah, in other parts of your tender, and you will be asked by Newham about modern slavery and your compliance to it. Therefore, I would strongly suggest as another action point that you go to the Newham website, put into their search where the search thing is on the Newham website, Newham Council website, modern slavery, and it'll come up with loads of information. And it's really useful for you to know that. And because you need to be on board with it to make sure that you're obviously that, that you are ethical supplier. OK, is important to them. OK, so we're getting to the end. We're getting to the end of this SQ, but there's still one big bit that we've got to do yet. Um, basically, um, after you've filled all those tick boxes in and you've either filled in your references or you've done, say you haven't got references, but, you, you know, you, you've filled your 500 words in there. There's going to be five or six additional questions in most SQs that you have to write answers for. Yeah, normally 500 to 750 word answers. OK, and these come at the end of the SQ and they are additional questions. OK, and here's an example. I can't use the ones that were in the newer one because they were very, very, very specialised all about care and that a lot of you aren't in care. So I've used very generic ones that I've taken from other SQs. But these are the kind of questions that you um, that you will be asked. What is the main business activity of your company? Now, I've put in there cleaning services because that's what most people will put or um, electrical work or gas servicing or security services. Now, I've just said these SQ questions are normally about 500 to 750 words and that's two. <laughs> so that isn't what you put cleaning services. That isn't. It might be the main business activity of your company, but remember, these questions are marked. They are not pass or fail. They are marked. And they are marked based on 
the quality of the response that you've given me. So if you've written two words, cleaning services, you're probably going to get half a mark out of a possible five marks. And then I'm going to come along and I'm going to write answer. What is the main business activity of your company? And I'm going to write something along the lines of ABC Cleaning deliver daily, weekly and annual scheduled and emergency cleans responding to COVID-19 and other emergency call outs in under two hours. Um, ABC Cleaning is a London based independent cleaning company operating across the whole of um, the London area, undertaking commercial and domestic cleaning, employing 120 full time staff from three offices in London. Um, we have provided high quality NHS accredited cleaning for the last 37 years. Current clients include um, several London boroughs, NHS trusts in London um, and schools, universities across the London area. Our specialist cleaning teams undertake kitchen cleaning, infection control, builders cleaning, student accommodation cleans. Um, ABC Cleaning are members of the British Institute of Cleaning and in 2021 won a professional service provider award at the Chamber of Commerce Awards. We will have 99% customer satisfaction with zero complaints in the last year. That's what I'm going to write for what is the main business activity of your company. And if I've written all that and somebody else has just written cleaning services, I'm going to get more marks. Simple. I'm going to get more marks. Therefore, I'm probably going to get pushed up, up, up and get through. And somebody that's just written two words is probably not. So this is where you need to put a bit more detail in. And there's another question there. How many staff do you employ? If you put 10, you're only going to get maybe one mark. If you put more information about the staff that you employ, for example, um, how many staff do you employ? Are they full-time? Are they part-time? Are they on the real living wage? Um, were they to be transferred? Um, have you got apprentices? Have you taken on any people that were not in employment or education? Um, where are they based? What's their locality? Um, how long have they worked for you? Give me more information. I know the question just asks you how many staff do you employ. I know that it does. But what the council or the buyer is trying to do is differentiate your company from some of the other companies. And it, that's they need to mark it and then mark that based on what you put in your answer. So just ask yourself, why have they asked the question? What's, why have they asked you how many staff you employ? My answer to that is they've asked you that because they want to know that you're capable and competent to deliver what they want you to deliver. And that means have you got enough managers, directors, supervisors, what are their qualifications, where do they live geographically, where are they based, you know, how long have they worked for you. So if you ask yourself, why do they want to know how many staff I employ? And you go, it's probably to make sure that we're capable to deliver the contract. All right, I'll tell them a bit more then. And that's where you start to build up a little bit more information in your answers. So always say to yourself, why have they asked me the question? What do they really want to know? And then that might give you some ideas of what more you can write. And then also say to yourself quietly, I wonder what Andrea's writing for this, because I bet she's writing more than one word. I bet she's busy in a way writing lots. Um, so, yeah, always try to, you know, don't go mad and don't go so far away that it's not relevant to employing staff but employing staff can be apprentices it can be um you know trainees it can be all sorts of things which will add value to your submission so think about it yeah don't just come out with the quickest first thing you can think of just because you've got to get this done in a hurry okay so you've completed that sq you've done it yeah, there will you will have other questions, I'm sure, but the most of that SQ has been complete, completed. Yeah, um, and you've been you passed it. You passed the SQ stage, and you've been you are deemed to be capable and competent company. So then you progress to the next stage, which is the ITT, the actual invitation to tender stage. You've moved from the SQ onto the ITT, and this is where you get to tell the buyer how you're going to deliver what you do, your services, your products what you deliver and at what price. So this is the really chunky bit, okay? Now, when you are on your e-portal, you will download lots of documents. That SQ document will be one of them. It will be a separate document. It might be part of another document, but it will be, normally it's a separate SQ, the supplier questionnaire. You will also download lots of other documents from the portal. Don't again be spooked 
by how many documents. So when you've got an opportunity and you've clicked on and you've followed a link and it's that tender that you want to write and you want to submit, you've got to download all the documents from the portal and save those documents. And these are the kind of documents that you're going to be downloading from a portal. There might be a lot of them. Don't, don't let that spook you. Just take your time to go through them all. Now, this might be quite a useful slide to come back to in the future. The red ones are for your information only. You need to read them. Remember, the best writers are the people that read everything. So you need to read all the, all the documents. But the ones in red on this slide are the ones for your information only. You don't have to send them back to the council. The terms and conditions you will have to send back eventually, but not till you awarded the contract. But they're for your information at tender stage. The green ones, as a general rule, you have to fill in and complete within the deadline time that you've got and submit back on the portal for the council, okay, or the hospital or whoever it is, okay. So that's the kind of documents that you can expect to see. Now, your instructions to tender is the first one is so, so important that you read every bit of it. Because in a public sector tender, you'll be told how many words you can use, what font to use, what colour font, whether you can use attachments, extra documents and attach them, whether you can use pictures, what date your tender's got to be in, what time on that day your tender's got to be in, how, everything, whether 2P applies, how your tender's being marked, it's all going to be in there. You've got to read it. The specifications there for your information, that's that document that tells you what the council wants. So you've got to make sure that you have fully read that specification, fully understand what they want, because when you are responding to their questions about how you're going to deliver a contract, you've got to deliver what they want, not what you do. What you do might not be the same as what they want. Well, you've got to deliver this contract how they want it delivering. OK, so make sure you read the specification. We've already talked about the terms and conditions. They're the council's terms and conditions. Read them. Make sure that you are complying. You, you can work to them. There'll be maybe, maybe not. It depends what you do. But there may be lots of additional information that they send to you as well. Could be maps, could be site plans, could be drawings, could be asset registers if you're in build, if you're working in building. Could be that 2P information. If it's a service tender and there's six staff working for another contractor and you have to take them on, their information will be in the additional information. But they give you all this information for a reason. You need to read it all and understand it all. Otherwise, your tender response when you fill it in won't be compliant. OK, so make sure you read all the documents that they've sent you. They haven't just sent you them just to make get, make your life um, a bit of a misery and keep you inside for the next two weeks. They've sent you them because they believe you need them to fill in your response document. OK, so then we come to the documents that you've downloaded from the portal that you need to complete and send back. And the biggest one will be the ITT response document. That is where you are putting in your responses to their questions and your, um, maybe they want proof of this and proof of that and all sorts of stuff, but that will go in the ITT response document, which you complete. You, so you download a copy, you download it from the portal, you electronically complete it, and then you re-upload it to the portal. Some portals you work online, therefore you have to answer the question in 500 words, copy it, and then put it into a box on an online portal. Portals, excuse me, portals do work differently. So you just have to understand what you have to do. If you have to fill in an online portal where you just have to put words in boxes, my um, advice would be for you to answer the question, set them all out on Word documents first, and then you can count how many words you've got. Then you can copy it all and then paste it into the portal box that you need. But most tenders are you complete a Word document and then you re-upload that whole Word document to the portal. OK, and this is where you need to get familiar with that Fusion portal and how it works. But certainly with Fusion, you download the green documents, you fill them in in Word and then you re-upload them as Word documents back to the Fusion portal. OK, 
In all tenders, you will have a pricing schedule to fill in. Quite often, it's an Excel spreadsheet and you have to fill in the cells. There'll be lots of protected cells that you can't change and they'll just be key cells that you need to fill in. Sometimes, it's, if it's depending on, again, what you do, if they only want one price, that price won't be on an Excel spreadsheet, probably. It will be in the ITT response document on a separate page that says fill in your hourly rate here. And you just put £10.60. And where I got that figure from, which randomly pulled it out of the sky. So it, it depends on how complex pricing is in what you do. OK, but there will be a pricing document. Do not think it's OK to ignore that pricing document and just put your own in. Can, you know, just create your own spreadsheet. Oh, well, well just send them that. You will be non-compliant. Yeah, you have to fill in the documents they have sent you, following the rules and the guidelines that are in the instruction to tenderers document. Okay. Then there will be some very formal forms, which have got lots of legal speak in them, which won't make an awful lot of sense to all of us. Um, I've got to put my hands up. They don't always make a whole lot of sense to me because it's such legal speak. But there will normally be a certificate of non-collusion, which all it requires generally is your director's signature. And again, don't panic about that. Get your director to sign a blank piece of paper. Might not be that happy with that, but most of them will if you explain why. Take a photograph of it, put it on the form, okay? Um, so and, and a non-collusion certificate basically is you saying that you haven't colluded with anybody. And by collusion, it means you haven't tried to... Um, Give the council a brown envelope saying, um, oh, you know, give me the contract and we'll, you know, we'll, 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 we'll give you some, you know, we'll do you some favours or we'll take to the football or we'll take to the whatever. That's not allowed. OK, it also means that you haven't colluded with other suppliers in your industry to price fix. And that did happen up in the Midlands in construction um, quite a few years ago now. But a lot of construction companies all got together and decided that they were going to bid for some big project pro building projects in London. But they were all going to collude on price and price fix. So they all went high. So whoever won it got it at an exorbitantly high price. And then the next project came out. Somebody else just went. Uh, yeah, yeah. So they all worked together to collude. Not allowed blacklist in cut off and, and struck off and all the rest of it not allowed so don't do that but you just have to see all you have to do is just sign a certificate to say that you haven't done that okay there's another one certificate of non-canvassing uh, and that's sorry that's the one that says you haven't canvassed um with a council you haven't you haven't tried to buy their favor that's that one sorry and then there's another one form of tender which is basically you saying that everything that you've put in your tender that if you are awarded the tender you will stand by it you will deliver on those promises so if you've made commitments in your tender saying that we will take on an apprentice we will donate. We will um, donate um, ten or twenty or thirty hours to voluntary work every year. You will, when you your director signs that form of tender, you're basically saying that you agree to the terms and conditions, and that everything in your tender is a bona fide tender, and that you will deliver on it. So there may well be other forms as well. So don't think that that is it. But those last three are just normally where you put a signature, your director's name, and a date. The two biggies there in green are your ITT response document and your pricing schedule, okay? And they're the ones that are gonna take a little bit of time for you to work on, okay? So I'm gonna, um, we are gonna have, a, a, there will be another break coming up um, shortly, but I do just need to crack on through another couple of slides. I hope everybody's okay with that. A lot of tenders give you a very helpful and useful tool, which is a checklist. And this is out of a London uh, borough of Newham tender. Uh, and they have looked, they've given you all the documents that you've downloaded. Yeah. And then they've told you what action you need to do with those documents, whether you need to just read them, whether you need to complete and submit, whether you need to read, sign and submit. Yeah. And then you tick, tick the one that you've got to complete and submit as when you send your tender back and you submit that checklist. And it's just really useful for you to use to keep, if you're completing a tender and there isn't a checklist, I make my own checklist, 
So when I've downloaded all the documents, I make one of these myself. I'll put, you know, document one, just read. Document two, read and sign. Document three, fit, you know, complete and submit. So I'll make my own checklist, but quite often you will be given a checklist in the bid somewhere or in the instructions to tenderers. Make sure you are you are reading it and you're doing what it says. Read, read, sign, read, submit, complete, and submit. Okay, they are they do try to help us. Trust me, they do. It is a complicated process, and that's not their fault. They're spending public money. They have to, they've got lots of procurement laws that they have to abide by, which is why it's very complicated sometimes. But they're not trying to make our lives difficult, and they will try and help us by giving us things like checklists, but we have got to read them. That's our commitment to it. We've got to read everything. Okay, this bit of the workshop is absolutely, in my opinion, critical that you understand. And it's one of my favorite bits because this is a bit that a lot of people don't necessarily really understand when they when they're not when they're quite new to tendering. And after this bit, people go ping and they have this bit of a light bulb moment that goes, oh, maybe that's why we're not winning, or maybe that's why we didn't win that bid. So Public sector tenders, so council, hospitals, social housing tenders are all um, marked using a similar style and method, um, and they're all auditable. So if you're sat there thinking it's all dodgy, they always give it to the same companies, we've never got a chance, it's all fixed, it isn't in the public sector. Public sector procurement people are scrutinized if not more than teachers are when Ofsted come in it's a similar kind of process they are scrutinized on how they evaluate your tender submission and there is a whole challenge process available to you if you don't agree with how they've marked it and that challenge process can, doesn't often because it costs a load of money, but it can end up in the high court. So they cannot get the evaluation of your tender wrong. They cannot go, oh, we'll give it to him because he's my mate. So it has to go through a very structured process. Now, we talked about meat earlier. Meat was most economically advantageous tender, and it's how the most services and supplies tenders in the public sector are evaluated. And it's basically the council in this situation going, right, we're going to put a percentage of what's important to us on the quality that's the bit you write. That's the bit you have to write all those answers to. Then we're going to put a percentage based on the what the price is. And then that obviously adds up because it's a percentage to 100%. I went to school. I never was very good at maths at school, but I do know that a percentage is 100%. So in this situation, on this tender, the council is saying, we're going to, everything that you write in your answers, we're going to mark it. And that's worth 60%. And then the price that you put in is worth 40%. And I will explain what it all means and how it all works. So if you're sitting there going, she's making no sense to me, you will get it in a minute. What I want you to understand from this slide is looking at that slide alone straight away, you, I am saying the Newham Council are putting more emphasis, they are more bothered about the quality of the service or the supplies or the goods that they receive than they are about how much they pay for them. Because 60% of their marking, their weighting, is on the quality. And only 40% is on the price. So you could be the absolute cheapest, but if your quality is rubbish, you're not going to win it. And I will explain how it works. Just bear with me. But you need to, in every tender that you download and decide, oh, I'm going to go for that. You need to look at this. This information here on the screen will be in the instructions to tenders document or guidelines document. It will tell you how the council is weighting the tender. Quality, price. Now, just a little story, very quickly, because I, I, I know I haven't got a lot of time. I do love my stories, but I haven't got a lot of time. 
I've got a company that does water hygiene uh, services. So they're going around buildings, they're checking for Legionella, they're checking that water is flowing through pipes, they're checking that all the lagging and all the pipe work is right. They're basically checking the quality of the water within that building that it is safe. And they do a lot of public sector and private sector work. If this tender was for water hygiene services and it came out, my client would be literally on the phone to me within two seconds going, we're going for this, we're going for it. That's his bid or no bid made. Never mind all the rest of that, that chart that I put up earlier for go or no go. He's on the it's 60% quality. We're going for this. We'll win it. He only empl employs this client of mine, engineers, to do the work. He's not a water testing company. He's a water engineering company. So if it's 60% quality and you took that company on, you are going to get the top quality, but he's not cheap. But his quality is right up here. He's the Howard's of the water testing world or the water hygiene world. He's Howard's. He's right up here because he employs very expensive engineers that have got years and years and years of experience. OK, so he would bid that. If it was the other way round and it was 40 percent quality, 60 percent price, he'd say to me, don't bid it. We're not going for it. Forget it. Bye. Oh, he'd probably be nice and say hello, but he would say we're not going for it because he knew he wouldn't be able to win it because he couldn't win on price because he's too expensive. And I, it will all make sense, I promise you, in a minute. But you need to understand that if you are very expensive in your field, and that could be fine. You could be in, in recruitment and you're a high-end, top-end recruiter that's only, you know, you know, placing skilled and really technical people. Therefore, you are expensive you're not gonna be a high street recruiter. You will beat them on quality, but you probably won't beat them on price. So you need to work out where do you sit. So hopefully you, you will see that in your tenders. If you haven't seen it, go and look at a tender document and look at what was the quality, what was the price. So basically what that then breaks down to is we are just now looking at the quality. Now this is the bit that you have to write and you will hear the word method statement. Now, method statement in this context is not the same method statement as in health and safety, where you have to have a risk assessment and a method statement. This is different. The, count, the council and public sector use method statement when they want you to answer a question or questions, okay? They, they want you to produce a method statement. They want you to tell them the methodology of how you're gonna do it. So they use that word method statement. So this is the quality section, the bit that you have to write. And there are seven. I don't know why the bottom one's blue, actually. I have no idea. But there are seven method statements that you have to write. And I'm just going to say each one of those you have got a maximum of a thousand words for. So that's seven thousand words maximum. Yeah, it's quite a bit of work, that, isn't it? It's worth 60 percent. Remember the whole lot. But they've broken it down. So let's just say that this was a cleaning contract, okay, to clean public buildings, yeah? The first method statement you have to write about is service delivery, and it's worth 15%. That one method statement that you have to write is worth 15%, and it's about service delivery. How are you going to deliver the services that the council want you to deliver that they've told you they want you to deliver in their specification? How are you going to deliver them? Who's going to deliver them? When are you going to deliver them? What equipment are you going to use? You know, where are you based? All that kind of stuff. 15%. The next method statement is on mobilizing the contract, 5%. So you're not the incumbent supplier. You've not got this contract, but boy, you could, you're going to win it because you're the best. So you're going to go for this contract and you're going to be a new supplier coming in because the old supplier has just been kicked out, just lost it because you've won it. How are you going to mobilize that contract? That's worth 5%. What you write about is worth 5%. Staff recruitment, training and development is worth 10%. So how do you recruit your staff? How do you train them? How do you develop them? What's your continuous uh, professional um, uh, improvement programs? What um, external training do they get? What appraisals do they get? All that kind of information you've got to write about and provide evidence, and that's worth 10%. And so on. You've got a contract and performance management, which is where all those KPIs and service level agreements come in. 
how you're going to monitor your performance on the contract. You've got a business continuity. We've already spoken about that. What happens when your cleaning store with all your consumables? So if you're a cleaning company, you normally have to provide toilet paper and soap, just wash, hand wash and all that kind of stuff. Well, the store has just been flooded and you've got nothing. You've got no toilet rolls because they're all bob bobbing around in about eight foot of water. So what are you going to do? You can't just say, oh, sorry, we can't supply you with toilet rolls for a month because <laughs> that might be a bit of a problem <laughs> if you haven't got toilet rolls for a month. So what are you going to do? That's your business continuity. That's worth 5%. Added value is worth 5% and social value is worth 10%. Come back to social value in a minute. But overall, yeah, you've got 60% for quality. But you've got to look at what's most important within quality to the council. And you know that by their weighting, sub weighting. They have put 15% on service delivery. So by far the most important thing to them is how you are going to deliver the services on time to the right standard with the right staff. That's 15%. And then you've got the... Recruitment, training and development, 10%. Contract performance management, 10%. And social value, 10%. Those three areas are also very important to the council because they put 10% on them. So these are the method statements that you're going to score the highest in if you get the full percentage. Because there's no point in putting a week's work into a method statement for the worth 5% and half a day into the one that's worth 15%. You've got to look at where are the most marks and how can I get the most mark. Ideally, you want to get full marks in all of those sections. OK, now social value moving forward will be in all our larger public sector tenders and it will be worth 10 percent. Social value, a lot of people worry about and they, they get scared about it and they think, how can we deliver it? We're only a small company. What well, you know, it, it, it's not relevant to us. Social value is relevant to absolutely everybody. And every business can, can deliver on social value. If you are a local company, you are already delivering on social value you might be paying business rates but you are taking a local you are working from the local area so you are contributing to the local economy you are employing local people even if it's only one or two their wages are being probably spent back in the local economy so you are helping the the, the, the economy by employing local people you might be able to uh, uh, employ apprentices that's huge on the social value scale giving people an opportunity to learn a skill and a trade. You might be able to offer work experience placements to students or to, to school, um, you know, year 11s uh, or 10 or 11. What year do they do? I can't remember now. Um, if you can offer work experience placements, that's good on the social value spectrum because you're giving children an opportunity to experience the workplace. OK, you might be able to support COVID-19 recovery in your local area by buying locally from local suppliers. So rather than next time you need to buy some stationery, you going to uh, Amazon and getting it from some huge warehouse in a brown box delivered by a drone, you could buy it from a local stationery shop, which would be helping local businesses recover from COVID. It could be a case of, you know, you need a new office chair. Again, rather than going straight onto Amazon, see if there's anybody in the local area that you can buy a second hand or a reconditioned office furniture from because then you're a you're buying it locally and b by by buying reconditioned you're helping with the environment and that whole reuse and recycle so have a think about it people say to me oh we just can't do that social value thing we're too small everybody can do social value by thinking about who do we employ where are we based what do we buy and how can we possibly do that differently? And offer work experience, offer, a, a, you know, a, have an apprentice, um, lots and lots of things we can do. And, you know, you only need to Google social value um, new and council and again the website's a great uh, a source of ideas there's lots if you google social value there's loads of business seminars from the chamber of commerce i'm sure the council will run them there's lots of um, seminars around delivering social value it's really important after covid companies have been devastated hospitality industry has been devastated so you know the next time you maybe if you're a company that's big enough to maybe treat your staff once a year to a christmas party or something or buy your staff a christmas present buy it locally 
you know, take them to a local pub, take them to a local restaurant, try and look after the local economy around where you are. OK, and that will really help. you. So that's just a little bit on social value, but it's worth 10 percent to you in this in this tender. So it's important. You've got to be able to prove that you will commit to supporting the local economy of Newham, of, 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 of buying locally, of employing locally, of, of offering opportunities. And you're going to have to stick your neck out and go, and I will do this. I will do this if I win this contract. Because Newham will be sitting there going, well, I'm going to give you a 10, you know, let's say a £25,000 contract and you can't give me 10 volunteering hours and take on an apprentice. Well, oh, that ain't very good, is it? So... The council are going, if I give you a, a 25, 50, 70, 90,000 pound contract over five years, what are you going to give the local economy back or the, how are you going to help the environment or how, what are you going to help the community with locally? OK, so have a think about that. So quality in this is worth 60 percent. But have a look at how it's been weighted and what is most important, which sex, which method statements are the most important and where's that's where more information's got to go in, more work's got to go in, more evidence has got to go in. Yeah. Now, in a section, if you look at that method statement one, service delivery, um, it's worth 15 percent. There might be there might be just one method statement in there, but there might be two or three different questions within that service delivery section that you have to address. Yes. If there's more than two or three or there might just be one. And each one of those method statements will get marked this using the same marking criteria. And I'm sorry, some of us, this is a long, long, long time ago, me included. Think back to going back to school and exam preparation when you were taught how to pass an exam and yeah you had to know it and you're supposed to revise but there was also some skills you got taught and how to pass exam and and it's very similar so and, and when they mark a tender and evaluate what you've written they use the same marking criteria for every answer that you've written and everybody else has written and it looks like this and you get given this in the instructions to tenderers and the guidelines so you need to be aiming high. Now, all my tender writers out there have to. They are trained to get a five. Yeah. So if they're writing for a client, they're aiming for a five. If they get five in every single answer that they do, they get an added bonus from me. They get a, 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 you know, a financial bonus from me because that is excellent in all aspects. So this will be different in all the tenders that you get. But again, this is from Newham. And in order to score the highest possible marks in the answer that you have written, your answer needs to be comprehensive. It needs to completely identify and meet all the requirements. Well, how, how do I know what the requirements are? How do I know what they want? It's in the specification or scope of work document that they have given you to read. So when you answer, you need to identify and meet all of their requirements to say how you're going to, you know that they want something done in two hours, you will do it in two hours, this is how you will do it in two hours, in fact you can do it in an hour and a half because you're local. You need to demonstrate in detail and offer a robust explanation of how it will be done, who will do it, if it's a services question, if it's a question just set for example about uniforms, a robust explanation would be what uniform will you provide your staff? Where do you buy it from? Is it a local supplier? Do you have extra uniforms in case there's any damage to uniform? How, you know, are there British standard made? Are they manufactured in Britain? How often, how many sets of uniform do your staff get? That's a robust explanation. You know, is it PPE? Is it protecting them? Are you going the extra mile to give them more protection? It's robust in its um, explanation. It offers an excellent, excellent explanation of the proposed methodology with detailed evidence and examples. So it's not just enough to say you will provide um, you will provide your services um, within this time scale because you're a local company. You've got to give evidence. So they would then want you to say, and on a similar contract, um, all our call outs, all our call outs, we had to attend within two hours. We actually attended 98 percent uh, in one and a half hours uh, and two percent in one hour. Something like that evidence or a testimonial to say 
Um, ABC cleaning are always here on time and whenever they're called out for an emergency, they are always here in under an hour by Bob Smith or Jane Smith or whoever. Okay, so you are looking for an excellent answer. If you go back and look at any tenders that you may well have written before, if some of you on the course have written tenders before but you've not been ex successful, go and look at the guidelines document you were sent to read and did you follow that? Did you do what they asked you to do? Did every answer that you gave provide that? Because if it didn't, you're kind of losing marks straight away. And as a professional tender writing company, we have to score five. <laughs> Otherwise, our clients won't use us anymore. Um, so that's what we have to do in every answer that we can. And, you know, if we go to a client and say we need evidence and they haven't got evidence or you haven't got evidence, you just have to sometimes go, well, I'm not going to get the top marks and I might only get a four. But somebody else might get a five and beat you. And points mean prizes in a tender. Points means the ultimate prize, which is winning the tender or winning a place on the framework. So you have to try, you have to go to the guidelines, the um, information for tenderers document. You have to look at how your tender is being marked. Each question that you are answering, how is it being marked? And then you have to do what it says. And they will be different. So it's not always going to be like that. You need to read it in each tender that you're working in. Okay, there's one more section and then we're going to have a break and I'll take questions as well. So that's how your quality answers in your tender are marked. They tell you how important each section is. They then tell you how they're marking each question. Do what they've asked for. Give them what they've asked for and you will score well. Forget, don't give them any examples, you're going to lose marks. Don't give them any evidence, you're going to lose marks. Don't give a robust explanation, you're going to lose marks. Don't answer it in line with what they want in their specification, you're going to lose marks. Don't answer the question at all, you're going to get zero. <laughs> we don't want that, you're rubbing on this course. No zeros, please. Can we at least be getting threes or fours as a minimum? But let's aim for fives, yeah? That's what we're aiming for. Okay. So hopefully that make, let, let, allows you to understand how what you write gets marked in the quality section, but it's in your guidelines. Now, this is another really important section. How does your pricing get marked? Now, you can read all that on the slide. I don't need to read it out. But in a nutshell, if 10 companies are all going for the same tender and 10 companies all put their price in, the lowest price tender gets the full marks for price. So if we've got 10 companies, yeah, and they've all put their price in, they've priced the same specification, they've looked at the job, they've looked at what they've got to do, they've priced it, the lowest price, so the cheapest price submitted out of those 10 documents, straight away gets the full marks for pricing, so gets the full percentage. So you need to be really, really on the ball when you're pricing your tender. And just like you cannot use the same text in every tender for the quality side, because you can't just copy and paste from one that you've done before and hope it's going to score marks and score well. It won't. You've got to answer the questions in line with what the buyer wants in this project. You've got to read the buyer specification and answer your questions. You can't use the same price list every time because that pricing percentage will change. And if it's 80% price, you've got to sharpen your pencil and go in as cheap as you possibly can. And I'll explain how it works in a minute. If it's 20% price on the next tender that you do, you can go in more expensive because price isn't as important quality is. 80% quality. So you've got to understand this and understand how it changes the price that you go in at. How important is price to, the, to Newham on the tender that you are bidding to win? And depending how important price is, depends how much you need to sharpen that pencil and how refined you have to get your pricing to get it as low as you can but still make a profit. Okay, so there's a formula that they use to 
to give you a score for your price. And, and I was never very good at math, so I, I prefer to look at it like this, mate. Right. So just say we've got um, we've got three companies. We've got company A and they submit a price of one thousand pounds. We've got company B that submitted a price of £1,400. And then we've got Selfridges that came along and submitted a price of 2900 So they're all bidding for the same contract to supply the same thing. And they've all... But company A decides to go in at £1,000 and company C decided to go in at 2900 And then you've got B somewhere in the middle. Now, the council, when they receive these bids, they have to evaluate them on quality and price. Now, you'll see I've switched it for this. So price is worth 60% in this example and quality is worth 40%. OK, so it's switched because every time you look at that will be different and you can't control it, but you have to be aware of it. So this is how they mark it using that formula that was on the other slide. This is the meat method. So company A was the lowest price bid received. So straight away, they get the maximum marks for price. So company A is sitting on 60% without anybody having marked the quality section yet. They've got 60% for price. That's like being 2-0 up in a game of football five minutes in. Hey! Yeah, brilliant. They're on 60% straight away. Yeah. If they've written a really, really good quality sender, which you will have done because you've been on this training, you're probably going to win it. Yeah. Anyway, company B came along and they priced and they were a little bit more expensive. They win it, it went in at 1,400. And that's where the calculation comes in because the, it is calculated to get over the, basically the lowest bid that's been received. And then it's worked, it's timed by the weighting, which is 60%. So it's timed by 60. And there you go. Bidder B, company B, uh, with a price of 1,400 pound, come out at 43%. Remember, bidder company A, two nil up already. They're on 60%, yeah? So uh, company B have maybe got half a goal, maybe one. <laughs> yeah. Company C, the selfridges of the lot, who would without a doubt, without a shadow of a doubt in my mind, company C will write the best quality bid, the best written. Answer all those questions we just looked at. They will answer them all brilliantly because they're selfridges, right? But they're too expensive. Because their price, when it's calculated using the formula that the council does, they come out at 20%. They can't win because, and the reason they can't win is even if they write the absolute best quality bid and answer all the questions and get five marks for every question and they get the full percentage. So there's 40% in this situation available for quality. They get 40% because they're the best. They've only got scored 20% on price. So the maximum they can score when you put the two together is 60%. Company A has already got 60%. They only have to, well, they can't score zero on quality because it would be non-compliant. So they've won it. They've already, they can't win, company C. And they can't win because their price was too far out. Now, this week, and this is absolute gospel, this week on Monday, I got a notification of um, a, a bid that we'd written for one of our clients that fits stair lifts, fits and maintains stair lifts. And they went for six lots six different lots one was hoist one was stair lift one was step lift different types of lift but they went for six lots four lots we won on quality top on quality top on price two lots we were top on quality blew everybody else out of the water lost on price i'm like because they went in too high so it didn't matter what we wrote because it was only worth 40 percent. the price was worth 60 percent, and they went too high and we couldn't claw it back because there wasn't enough. We could only get them. For, and we did get them the 40 percent, but they, they were too far behind on price. So pricing is really important. But you know what? A lot of people say to me, it's always all about price in this situation on the screen. Yeah, it is about price because price is worth 60 percent. But go, let me just take you back to this situation. Well, I'll get there eventually.
Right. Let me take you back to this situation. Nobody can sit there to me and say, oh, I don't know, I'll, I'll tender in. It doesn't matter what you write. It's all about price. In this situation, it isn't. 60% quality. That's what you write. That's all you, who you are, how you're going to do the job, why you're going to do it that way, your staff, your quality standards, your social value. There's only 40% for price. So if you're thinking you're going to win it all on price, you're not in this situation. You're not going to win it on price. You've got to have the quality behind you and the evidence and everything. But, you know, in this situation, you could win it on price, but you still need to have some good quality stuff as well. But it's not it's not the most important factor. So I really, really hope that makes sense to you and you understand. I'm a little bit freaked out because there's 48 questions in the chat. So that's a little bit of freaking out. I'm hoping that quite a lot of those are just thumbs up saying that everybody was back after the um, after the break last time. But we are going to have another break now um so it's five two so um can we come back at 10 past please and then we'll be into the last section and we are making pretty good time but i haven't started to cover yet how you write a really really good answer and what needs to be in a really really good answer so we've got that to cover in the last section um which will really help you get massively high scores on your quality sections okay so back at 10 past if that's okay um yeah and uh, enjoy your break uh, and i'll see you back here at 10 past and i'll try and address some of the questions thank you see you at 10 past Okay, 10 past then. So um, I will go again. Um, we have had a, a huge, huge, huge amount of questions. I don't know whether that's a good thing or not. I, I think it's a good thing. Uh, it showed that people are really engaged and really interested. So um, I'm taking it as a good thing. I don't know whether I'm going to be able to get through them all. Um, so what I am going to suggest to the organisers um, of uh, the webinar is that we collect all the questions um, and we will do, um, we will answer them and send them around to everybody. I think that's probably going to be the best thing to do. And um, some of the questions I won't be able to answer either because they are very, um, they are questions about procurement within Newham. Obviously, I'm a tender writer, I'm writing tenders all, all the time, but I don't know how Newham run certain things. So um, there are some questions that are going to have to go to new um, um, procurement and um, so there are there are a few that I can um, uh, I, I, I can address uh, quickly and I'll do those at the end um, there's some on subcontractors there's one on business continuity so yeah I'm not going to ignore them all and I will come and answer those at the end um, but I, I, I what I want you all to know that is we will address your questions but I think that because of the time element and I'm very conscious that I don't want to keep anybody here more than four hours because four hours is quite a long time sitting and listening um that we'll address them all and send them out um uh, on, 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 with all the other information so i hope that's okay and i hope that's all right with uh, with you julia and, and and the others on the call but i just don't think i can address them all verbally um in time so okay so We've done quite a lot so far. We've learned about what an SQ looks like. We've got to get through that first stage and we've learned how to do that. Lots of yes, no's, but also the really important references table, um, proving that we've got experience and that we can deliver it and we're, we're prepared to put names down. And if we haven't got that and we haven't been in business that long, we've got to talk about ourselves and our history and give them enough evidence and proof that we are competent and capable. So we've done that. We've looked at some standard SQ questions that we might be asked and not giving one word answers, making sure we expand on them. Then we've talked about IT, ITT, the actual tender documents and what to expect when we download them from Fusion. And there's a really important document in all, all of the documents are important, but we've looked at which ones we need to read and then which ones we need to complete and send back. And we've talked about the instructions to tenderers and we've talked about how um, the, the council telling us how our tenders are evaluated. What's important to them more? Is it price or is it quality? Um, or the other way around, it will depend on what the tender is for. Within the quality section, what are the most important bits? Service delivery is normally the highest scoring one. That's the most important to them. And then we now know how each answer that we produce, each answer that we write, a uh, each question that we write an answer response to, how it's going to be marked. We know what we've got to do because they've told us. So we've done all that. So we also know how our pricing works and how they're evaluating our price. Basically, lowest price gets the full percentage. 
available. And then everybody else that's more expensive comes in behind that retrospectively. And that depends on how far away your price is from the lowest price that's been submitted. So people have asked me, can you help me with price and what price do I go out in at and how do I get the right price? You've got to know your industry. You've got to know your competitors. You've got to know who you're up against. You've got to know where you sit in the market. How do you get the best price? You've got to look at what does the spec say? What does the client, what have they asked you to deliver? You need price what they've asked you to deliver at your best possible price while still making a profit you've got to remember this is public sector business and public sectors have budgets and they're not going to have an unlimited uh, pot of money so you have to be really realistic with how much margin you want to make and um, you've got to make sure you've covered all your costs though so you've got your pricing is very personal to you and, and everybody will be asked to price things um totally different and that's my phone ringing, excuse me um people will be asked to price things totally different depending on whether they're supplying goods or services. So it's a really wide open one. So if people have got very particular questions on price, again, we can cover those, but let's let's cover those after the webinar. Okay. So we need to just talk a little bit before we go in this last uh, 45 minutes, really, about how we write. What makes a winning answer? What does a fabulous answer look like? What does an answer that's going to score those five top marks, what does it actually contain? And I can't just give you a model answer. I mean, I gave you that reference example earlier, but I can't give you a model answer because you all do different things and you're all in different companies and do different things. But what I need to do is give you the process of how you build up a, a winning answer. Now, this is an example. Don't all leave at this point, please. This is an example of a question question or a, a, a statement that you may be faced with in a tender and this would be in that high scoring service delivery section that in that when we just looked on before we had a break it was worth 15 percent, and you would have to respond to this and you look at that and i'm not kidding you i've been doing this job for many 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 years and writing tenders for 20 plus years and i look at that and go wow that's a lot and that's the question never mind what you've got to come up with as an answer so there's some tricks and there's some skills and there's some ways of making a your life as a tender writer a little bit easier and the first one basically is to break down the what you're being asked into separate parts and then address each separate part to make sure that you do address the whole thing and that you're not overwhelmed by it. it's just all a jumble of stuff all over the place so you've got to even though they're not helping you with a question like that you've got to help them when they're marking it by very clearly having headings as to what you're addressing and what you're answering and to show that you've answered the whole question and again i remember years and years and years ago back at school we're always being always being told read the whole question and answer the whole question don't just answer the first bit of it and forget the rest because there's marks for each bit of that so Breaking down the question is critical when you've got a huge chunk that you've got to address. And that's a, you know, please describe how the services will be delivered, identify roles and experience, uh, explain and describe if you're going to deliver as part of a consortium, describe how you will work with other organisations. I mean, the questions, you know, I don't know how many words in itself. So if we look at this slide, all I've done on that slide is break down by colour that question. And it suddenly, well, it does for me because I've been doing it for a long time. And when I train my tender writers, it suddenly becomes easier to attack and easier to take it on because now you're taking on the red section, the green section, the purple section and the grey section. So you're starting with how the service will be delivered. Now, what happens with this question every time? And I use this as a training question for my own staff. I use it on all my training courses. And when I'm training my own staff and they have to actually answer this question as a training uh, element in the office, they will go, it says there, please describe how the services will be delivered 
and identified by roles and experience those responsible for managing service delivery. What I will get every single time, or maybe nine and a half times out of 10 when I get someone to do that first bit there, is they will answer that all as one. And they will ignore the please the red bit, describe how the services will be delivered. They will ignore that and they will just go straight into the green section identified by roles and experience. So basically, they will go to answer, please describe how the services will be delivered and identified by roles and experience. They will just go, we will put four operatives on the contract and the contract manager. The contract manager has been with us X number of years. And they've missed a whole bit of the question out. The first bit in red says, please describe how the services will be delivered, not who will deliver them. That's the green bit. How you will deliver services is not the same as who will deliver them. So a trained tender writer will look at that and go, there's two big sections there, how and who. So just say that this was a, um, a tender for, let's just say grounds maintenance, grass cutting, tree, um, you know, pr uh, pruning of trees and hedges and that kind of thing and grass cutting and weeding. Please describe how the services will be delivered. So that's where are you based? Where is your depot? How many vehicles have you got? What plant and equipment have you got? What plant and equipment will you be using on this contract? How do we get in touch with you? How quickly can you get out to an emergency if a tree has fallen down on a road? What accreditations and awards have you got or safety of qualifications have you got to deliver the services that you need to? How will you deliver the services is not who. So you would have missed a whole section on your location, your accreditations, your equipment, your plant, your response times, communication, your office, your call centre, anything, because that is how are you going to deliver it? How are you going to deliver what they've asked you to in the spec? How? That's the first bit of the question. And then the second bit is who is going to do it? So then you go into account manager, two or three operatives, one mobile in a van, one tree surgeon, you know, two guys that are horticultural people that do planting and weeding, blah, blah, blah. They've been with us X number of years, their qualifications, experience. That's the who. But by breaking the question down and taking time to read it carefully and reread it, you realise there's two bits at the top, not one. Then you need to go on to the purple bit, explain and describe if you intend to deliver the services as part of a consortium or with subcontractors. That's how you're going to do it. And you've already answered that in the SQ bit. You've had to fill in that table if you're using associates or subcontractors. This is you saying... You know, we will be delivering the contract 100% internally using all our own full-time staff who are all paid the real living wage, that all live in the London Borough of Newham, and um, that have all worked for us for seven years plus. Um, we do have contingency if any of our staff are off. We have um, a, a agency that we've used for, we work with for years. We have got some contractors we can call on if we couldn't do the work ourselves, but we fully intend to deliver this contract 100% using our own staff. Yeah. Or if you're not using, if you are doing a, a subcontractor route, we would intend to deliver 10 percent of the contract ourselves and 90 percent using subcontractors. The subcontractors we will use are X, Y and Z. Now, I have been asked a question on this. Somebody has asked a question and it's a really good question. Um, I, I don't know who it was because I haven't got my question list up, but somebody's put basically we've got hundreds of associates or subcontractors we, we could use. Do I have to list them all? You you need to look at who look at the contract look at what you've been asked to deliver who would be the best contractors to use on this job and talk about them and put their details in now the public sector are aware that you may well commit to using three subcontractors or four subcontractors and by the time this tender has actually gone through being evaluated you've been awarded it you know that could be seven eight months down the line those subcontractors aren't available that's not a major issue you would have to declare the new subcontractors you were going to use you're not going to get kicked off for that what the council is asking you in the tender is do you intend to work with subcontractors if they want to know how do you select your subcontractors or associates how do you vet them 
How do you manage them? How do you monitor them? If you are using subcontractors, how do you know they are going to deliver the services to the right standard? So it's all about recruiting, selecting, vetting, managing, monitoring them. That's what they want to know. And they do want you to give an example. They, they do want you to say, who will you use? And you do need to give a good idea of who you're going to use. If it's a training company and you've got hundreds of training associates that do training for you, you need to pick your three or four best that are most suited for this contract and put their details in. If when it came to it, they were they taken another job or they were ill or they couldn't do it, you would have to substitute them with somebody of a similar ilk or standard. And they that would be understood. But what they want to know is that you've actually got these people available to you. So that's what where we're coming from with subcontractors. OK, so breaking down the question makes it more manageable for you to um, answer the next project. The next bit that I do with my my tender right when I'm training them and they this is how they work on every single tender and there's a mind map there whether we call it mind map or storyboarding or there's lots of different ways that we call it but basically when we've broken down that tender into sections and these sections are what we have to address in each bubble service delivery how will we deliver it and I make notes depot offices locations plant equipment time scales then team to deliver who will deliver names roles qualifications experience by bio, mini biographies don't put the whole cv in not interested if they do yoga, dog walking and read novels. I, you know, that's good. And that's really good. I'm, I'm happy. But I don't want to know that in a tender. What I want to know in a tender is their qualifications that are relevant to this job, their experience and, and, and why they're good for this contract. That needs to be in a biography as opposed to a CV that's got everything they've ever done since they left school, because that's just not a lot. Of that's not relevant. Service delivery model. Are we doing it sole? Are we the only supplier? What's our contingency if we are? Are we using subcontractors? What percentage who are we using? Make notes. Working with third parties, that was part of that question. If we just, sorry, if we just go back. Um, it, as the question moved on, it said, um, how you will work jointly with other organizations. That's separate to the purple. The purple is your business model. Are you going to deliver this contract on your own or with subcontractors or in a consortium? The gray bit is separate. How you will work jointly with other organizations. And yes, it does include consortium partners and other subcontracts, but it might be other organizations. If I go back to the example that this was from a tender for grounds maintenance, which included trees, if there was a tree down in an emergency on a road, you would have to work with other organisations, the police, the highways agency, the council, possibly the fire brigade. You're going to have to work with other organisations in all the, your areas of work that all you do and you all do different things. You're going to have to work with other organisations. CQC, if you're in the care industry, you're going to have to work with health and safety executive, possibly. You're going to have to work with the environment agency, maybe. You're going to have to work with Ofsted, maybe. You're going to have to work with the Department of Education. There's going to be lots of other organisations. And if you miss that in this question because you haven't split it out and you've just lumped it all in with a purple bit, you're going to lose marks. So how you will work jointly with other organisations. OK, you need to cover that. Um, so here, working with third parties or other organisations, council, police, highways, agency, health and safety executive, and get some case studies together of how you do that and how you've done that and when you've done it and how you communicate quickly and effectively and how you work together. Yeah, so you need to split your headings off. And then these bubbles, they become your answer. Because they are your headings to make your answer. So when I am, if I am evaluating your answer to that slide, that, 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 that question that you were faced with, I want to know that you've covered all my points. Therefore, you're going to have your first heading is going to be service delivery. Then you're going to write about all those things, where your offices are, how big they are, how many staff you've got, what equipment you've got, what plant you've got how often it's maintained, how many bits of each equipment you've got, what happens if your plant breaks down, all that kind of thing. That's in one section. Your next section is then going to have account team to deliver Newham's contract, and I'm going to give them the, you know, the names and their experience. And then your next bit of your answer is going to be 
our service delivery model and you're going to put we're going to deliver this contract on our own we have this that and the other an x number of staff and we can call on relief staff from here and we've got another office here that could help and, and all that kind of thing or alternatively in your service delivery heading you're going to write about your subcontractors and then your next heading is going to be working with third parties and that's where you're going to put we have extensive experience over the last three years of working with a health and safety executive or working with a highways agency to make sure that we're coordinated, that we're carrying out works at the right time, at a quiet time to avoid disruption, all that kind of stuff. And then it, as part of that big question, it also said that you have to ensure that you were always delivered a single coherent service. So you need to bring that in somewhere within your answer with a heading using their language. I always try and mirror in my answer the language and the words that they've used in their question, because then that brings familiarity to them when they're reading it. But some key tips here, create headings. Do not write top to bottom, justified text, no headings, no breaks, no visuals, no nothing, because it's really, really hard to mark. And I'm sure you've all got some absolutely fabulous stuff you can write in your tenders, but if it gets lost just in a mass of text, it doesn't mean anything. You lose it. You were the person that's reading it, it's just blinded by words. So break it up, have headings and cover. But I tend to do this mapping exercise with every answer. So if I've got 10 answers, I'll map every answer out before I start to write it. I'll break each question down, I'll create my headings, and then I'll go, right, what do I need under there? I need CVs there. I need um, a list of assets and plant and equipment or vehicle list there. What do I need here? I need some um, KPIs that we've done on a similar prod contract to show that we can do this and our performance was good. What do I and I make notes. It just makes it a lot easier when you come to write the finished answer that you know where you're going. You've got a map. It's like, you know, you wouldn't set off on a journey without your sat nav or a map. Oh, bless my dad still uses a map. But you wouldn't go on a journey without a map or a sat nav. You, know, you need to know where you're going. And this is kind of your map of how, you, how you're going to get to your finished answer because you need to talk about all those things. But it's all down there. You've gone. And then you go to the next question and you read it and then you break it down. And you create your headings and then under each heading you go right i need to put in there that 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 and you start to and you do that for all your answers and that's how my my um tender writers out there work uh, and it does really really help them and um, rather than just start every, you've got 10 blank pages with 10 questions at the top and nothing and you go oh here we go right where am i going to start you need to do that bit of an exercise and it really does come up with it helps you um helps you um produce a better answer better quality answer, and actually key is it makes sure you answer the whole question rather than missing bits of it out but the, one of the key key things break down the question and make sure you haven't missed any bits of it because quite often there'll be marks for each bit of that and if you don't miss a whole bit out like that how not who you will lose marks okay another really top tip massively important and i have mentioned this document several times today is the council will give you or the public sector organization you are bidding for will send you when you download the documents from the portal you will download a document called specification or scope of work that for me is critical that you read it and read it again and get a print it get a highlight pen and highlight bits of it that is them telling you what they want delivered. So that is what you've got to do. It's not, and you know, a lot of people, when they write tenders, they copy their marketing material or they copy all the stuff on their website and dump it in. And I'm not saying marketing material isn't important because marketing material is really important for business. You need a website, you know, you need your marketing, whatever your e-brochures now, or you need marketing material. But marketing material tells the world what your company does. Brilliant. You need it. Doesn't go in a tender, though. In a tender, you need to tell the council how, who, what, when, where you're going to deliver what they want in their specification. Yeah. And that's the difference. 
because your website won't be as detailed as how you deliver in this contract to this council. So make sure you really do respect that specification and scope of work. On the other hand, if you read that specification or scope of work and go, really? That's so out of date that we can do it so much more efficiently. We can do it in such a more sustainable and greener way. In fact, we can do it much quicker, which is going to save time, which is going to keep their customers happy. Do not be afraid to get that in. And that's what I put in the middle of there. Exceed it. Read their spec. And if it says we need you to respond in two hours and because you're literally next door because you're a local company, you can respond in 30 minutes. Get that in there, but tell them that you're exceeding their requirements. Say we see, you know, we understand from your specification that you require us to respond in a maximum of two hours. As a local company, two miles from your head office or your town hall, we can be on site within 30 minutes with a local operative that lives in the borough, that knows the building and knows the area. Yeah, this exceeds your requirements by an hour and a half which will bring faster resolution, which brings better customer satisfaction. So just don't just take it. If that's what they want, that's what we've got to deliver. That, yes, that's what they want. But if you can deliver better and is a benefit to that, that's happy days. Yeah, get it in there. Okay. So whenever you're answering a question, yeah, can you imagine if you said... Um, if it, if it said in the council specifications, should you receive any complaints, these need to be rectified within a maximum of 48 hours. And you put, we rectify all complaints within five days because that's what you wrote in the tender that you did before or that's what, that's what you do. Well, you're non-compliant. You're going to be a big fat zero. Because if they want complaints rectified in 48 hours and you're saying five days, that's not very good. So that's why it's so important that you read their specification and you tell them how you're going to deliver what they want and they have asked for to their standards, their time scales. Yeah, not just what you do. OK, so tip there. Uh, always, always read the spec. OK. Um, evidence. So <laughs> another tip for you. Best practice in tender writing session. This bit is you, in my opinion, and if we remember when we look back at how they were marking the equality questions um, that uh, you were going to write. Um, what did they put, how they were going to, to get five marks, you needed to do a lot more, but at the end it said, excellent explanation of the proposed methodology with detailed evidence and robust examples. So you are never going to get top marks, five, five, which is the top mark available for your answer, if it doesn't contain evidence and robust examples. Okay. So what's evidence? Evidence is anything that backs up that you can do what you say you can do or and you have done what you say you can do. Yeah. You might be talking about your warehouse, you know. Yes, we you know, and your stock, you might not sell products and you might be saying, um, you know, we have um, a large warehouse um, in Newham, um, which is X, X number of meters squared, um, where we hold um, half a million pounds worth of stock, um, which includes if it was a school uniform tender, uh, 2000 blazers. Now, that's great and that's impressive and I'm loving the statistics. But hey, put a picture in of 2000 blazers hanging up and people go, oh, my gosh, look at all them blazers. Wow, they've got a lot of blazers. And that straight away jumps off the page at me and goes, wow, that's a lot of blazers. They've got loads of stock as opposed to just reading that you've got 2000 blazers. Who, re unless you work in a warehouse with 2000 blazers, do you know what 2000 blazers look like? Because I'm trying to imagine what 2000 blazers are. That's it's just powerful. If you, you've got an online shopping cart and you, you sell a lot online. Give us some examples of your online cart. You know, I was actually this this online shopping cart for this school uniform company that I write for. 
they were they were the incumbent suppliers so you know they, they were after you have a website can parents shop online yes they do we actually put the school uniform that we were bidding for again because it was a rebid because they would already had the contract but they had to rebid for it after five years we put all the pages of of, of that school's uniform so when the market they go oh, that's our uniform because <laughs> yeah, we're supplying you now do you know what i mean so anything that you can do like that Reviews we talked about, trust pilot reviews, yeah. Reviews on social media, Google reviews, yeah. Five star reviews, absolutely fabulous to back up. If you're saying that you're great at customer service, if you're saying that your engineers are really friendly, if you're saying that you're always on time, stick a review in that backs it up. Oh, the engineer was absolutely, he was early, you know, he was clean, he was tidy, he even made me a cup of tea or whatever. Do you know what I mean? Just put in something that backs up that what you're saying key performance indicators we've talked about a lot yeah and you can do tables for them you can do pie charts yeah you there's a screenshot here about customer services i can't really really read it very well but it says 80.9 percent customer satisfaction 89.1 percent i can't read that i think it's um customers satisfied with the response they received from the call center and then it's how many calls were answered with, within certain rings how many queries was, were, were, were dealt with by email within 24 hours etc so it's just it that's like a, a, a visual and yes you can write all that in text but I, if you are allowed to use visuals in your tender and you do need to check um, in the instructions to tenders, you need, do need to check this. But if you are allowed to use visuals and pictures and images and charts, please use them. I have marked tenders and when it's wall to wall text, all text, you're just like, oh. You lose the world to live sometimes because it's just reading thousands and thousands and thousands of words. So please get visuals in where you can. Now, there is two handouts that go with this slide. Uh, and you will obviously have, as I said, been sent them all. Uh, and I have we have taken note that some of you said it would have been useful to have them beforehand. We've taken note of that. And I really do appreciate your comments on that. But there are two handouts. There is a case study template, which you can populate, because um, this is just one that I've done for school uniform, but it's a template that you can use and populate. And it gives you the headings, you know, dates to supply the client. A case study is just basically um, a business story about you supplying a client and how what you supplied and challenge the challenges that you've Based and how you overcame those challenges and what the outcomes were and maybe a testimonial on there your kpi statistics on there and it's all on one page so you i'll send you that as a template which you can type directly into and get it changed for your own business so they're really really fabulous evidence so any contracts that you are currently working on it doesn't need to be a tendered contract it can just be a contract that you've agreed to on a handshake over a table the private sector contract get a case study written on it with statistics in it. How much, how often, how satisfied, numbers in there. How many cleans do you do? How many windows do you clean? How many acres of grass do you cut? Get statistics in. How many people work on the contract, that kind of thing. And then there's another handout that goes with it, which is basically just um, top tips to write a good case study. So you've got that as well, um, which will just help you uh, make sure that you can actually write some of those for your current business that you've got okay but never if you've got a facebook page um and you advertise things on facebook take some screenshots if you've got comments coming through on facebook and they're and they're and they're positive take some screenshots we've talked about social value today we're doing charity work doing voluntary work if you're shouting about it on your website or you're shouting about it on social media take some screenshots that's your evidence of your, your volunteering or your, or, or your charity day or your, your, your stall or, or, or donating Christmas presents in the community. Whatever it is, get some photos. You can always blank out people's faces if you need to, but you've got some evidence. And evidence is everything. It really is. It backs up. It's not just enough to say you can do it, how are you going to do it and who's going to do it. I still need the proof that you've done it. OK, so evidence is really key, but evidence comes in so many different forms and different formats. But just try and think, what can I use to show that I've done this? I've proved that I've done this. And it could be statistics. It could be figures. It could be pie charts. It could be photographs. It will differ. OK, so evidence, massive top tip and skill for tender writing is use evidence in your answers. 
and most, if not all, of those instructions on how to get five marks, the top scoring answer, will to be to include evidence. Okay. Okay, yet another top tip, best practice for tender writing is features and benefits. Now, I was taught my sales training and um, tender writing training in a long long time ago uh, and I remember still to this day I remember watching a, a, a sales training video uh, on features and benefits with um, um, John Cleese in it I can, I'll never forget it and this always sticks in my mind and he always said and he stood in front of the camera and I, I don't know whether it was Basil Fawlty or John, or John Cleese but he says features tell benefits sell now what that means is we are a local Newham based company. That's a feature about your company. So that is telling me that you are a local Newham based company. It's a feature. Features tell, benefits sell. So if you are writing in your tender, we are a local Newham based company. I go, so what? What's the benefit of you being a local Newman based company? What benefit is it to the council of awarding a contract to a local Newman based company? Well, we've talked about it. It's massive benefit. Yeah? You're a local company, you're employing local people, helping the local economy, helping that COVID-19 recovery, because you're local, you can get to the jobs quicker. You know the local area. You've got local knowledge of the area. Your revenue that you're paying, your, your wages that you're paying staff is probably being re-spent back in the local economy. Again, good for the economy. Because you're a local company, you've got less travel miles to get to jobs, to get, you know, that's brilliant for the environment. Because you're a local company, you can help local-based um, social value projects as opposed to being based 350 miles away. So the so what is what you need to follow up with. So you need to get used to writing in your tenders. We are a local Newman based company, which means that we are contributing to the local economy by employing two staff, three staff, taking on an apprentice. We are, um, um, we are creating local opportunities opportunities for young people in training and education. We are supporting local charities being a local based company and then you need to talk to me about those charities and say what well, so you need to give me the which means that when um, evaluators and, and, and procurement people are marking your tenders they are really want to see all these features they want to see you a local new, new and based company, but they can't give you a mark for the, which means that unless you write it down. Now there's a saying, and he's, again, going back to school, I know, if you don't write it down on the paper, you won't get any marks. So they cannot mark you for the benefits of you being a local company, unless you write down what those benefits are. So if you just write, we're a local company, and I write, we're a local company, which means that, and then follow it up with all those economic and social and environmental, I'm going to get more marks because I've written more and I've written the benefit. So just remember that from school. Remember even in math, they always used to say, look, if you can't answer it, just put your workings out down. And at least you'll get a mark for that because you always used to say, if it's not written down, you haven't shown your workings out, you can't get any marks for it. I still remember that now. And I'm 50 something, so it's a long time since I was at school. So the next one there, it's another feature. All our engineers wear full branded uniform and PPE, personal protective equipment, and our vans are branded both with our logo and the council's. Brilliant, brilliant feature. So what? What's the benefit? You are telling me there with that feature that your staff have all got branded uniforms and PPE and your vans have got logos on. You are telling me. But you are not selling to me the benefit of that. So which means that? Why do we pay for expensive branded uniform? Why do we get our vans 
um, with signs on it. A lot of it is for marketing reasons, so that people recognise our company. A lot of it is because we look professional if we've got our company logo on us. But also, a lot of it is if you're working with the general public is for safeguarding reasons, which means that all our staff are easily and immediately identifiable as working for a BC cleaning in partnership with the London Borough of Newham. It says it on our van, so when we arrive at the building, they know who we are. When we walk in, we've got ID badges and branded uniforms on, so people feel it's less of a risk of that bogus callers and people turning up to say they're engineers when they're not. So it's just links back to safeguarding and also the, the professionalism that the council looks like. If the council... I've got people cutting grass and they're all in right uniform with the right PPE with branded names, you know, working, working in partnership with New Borough Council. It just it, it looks professional rather than a load of people cutting the grass that are in, you know, ripped jeans. And that ain't going to look good for the council. So just have a think about the why and the which means that. OK, really, really good point. That. I hope that's a bit of a light and full uh, point for you. So features tell benefits sell okay so go go when you write in you know all, all our staff have mobile phones so what we have a local call center so what yeah you do it's good so i'm not saying you shouldn't be putting we have a local call center but tell me more what's the benefit of it okay hopefully that makes sense so at 10 to 2, I'm on to the last slide. <laughs> so I'm doing all right. <laughs> OK, so just a bit of a, a summary and, and top tips, really, across the whole webinar. Um, and I hope we still have quite a lot of people on this webinar. I am absolutely, I'm really chuffed about that because it is four hours. And I do realise it's quite a long time to keep your um, attention. Um, but we, we don't seem to have lost too many people over the duration. So uh, hopefully that means that it, 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 you've enjoyed it. But my final top tips, and I'm going to just give, deliver these with some welly and passion because the one thing you need to have to be successful in tenders is be passionate now you are all i am absolutely sure because you wouldn't have given four hours of your lives up today if you weren't passionate about your business and winning more work to do that, you've got to put that passion into your tenders that you're completing and give them the time and give them the passion and, and make them jump off the page. So when somebody reads them, they're going, this company is awesome. This company is brilliant. I really want to work with this company. If you're just copying and pasting from what you've done before or copying and pasting off your website, that's not going to win you the tender. OK, so. Top tip number one, download from your e-portal and read everything. Yeah, I'm really sorry. And there is going to be a lot to read, but you need to read it all. OK, ha, you know, I'm not suggesting you print all the documents because you'll kill a small forest if you do that, if you're doing lots of tenders. But you do need to highlight on your, your computer or, or I would definitely um, print off the specification, highlight it, make notes. Best tender writers are those that read everything. Everybody out there, my tender writers out there, they don't even start tippy tapping away and filling um, filling anything in until they've read everything. And it could take them a day, even longer, to read all the documents. Establish the right team around you to write that tender. Um, and and when, when I say the right team, you're on this course, so I'm presuming you're the one that's going to be writing these tenders. But you might need support from other people if you've got them, your subcontractors, your associates, other people in your company that have got on the ground, that have done the job, that got the right experience, that know the best way to deliver that specification, that know all about the job. You need them to help you. They might not need to write anything, but boy, they need to talk to you and you need to get their experience. Um, never assume if you read the tender documents or you're on the portal or you've got your specification or you've got your terms and conditions and you don't something isn't right something doesn't look right something doesn't feel right you you, you don't agree with something don't just sit there and live with it ask questions 
ask the buyer questions on the portal. It's okay. You know, I know some of the procurement people at Newham and they want to be asked questions. If that means they're going to get a better quality tender submitted, they don't mind addressing questions. So ask questions to Newham, ask questions to the buyer. You have to go about it the right way. You have to go on the e-portal and ask them through there, but do ask questions. And also, you know, I was, I, was I was expressly asked to say this, that if you, and hopefully after this course today, you'll understand this, but if you've been given a 500 word, word count to answer a question, and there's absolutely no way you can do it in 500 words because you need a thousand, ask them for more words, but tell them why. You know, we think this is a really important question. We need to cover safeguarding. We need to cover vetting of staff. We need to cover selection of staff. We need to cover recruitment training. We can't get all that in 500 words. Please, would you consider increasing the word count? That's fine. Not a problem at all. They might say no. Generally, if you put a good backup, um, uh, they will they will agree to that. So I've just done that this week, actually, on the tender. Um, We've covered how is your tender being marked. Make sure before you go headlong into writing a tender, you know how important is price, how important is quality. Within the quality section, what are the most important bits because which are the most weighted section and massively important, how is each question being marked? What does it say I have to do to get five marks? Because that's what you've got to do, okay? We talked about this and somebody's asked me about this, you know, um, about a competitors and who's delivering now and, and, and how do I know, how do I get my price right? And somebody's asked an absolutely brilliant question um, about, um, you know, how do we find out about companies that this council are using so maybe they can subcontract to those, those companies or be an associate. So let's just say that London Borough of Newham already have a, a tender out for training, yeah? And you're an associate trainer and you want to get on and get some work from it. How do you find out? There is a thing called the Newham Contracts Register. And that tells you and the link to it is there. So when you get these slides, you will be able to click on that link. Um, so the Newham contract register tells you all the contracts in Newham, when they're due up for renewal, who the incumbent supplier is now. So you can make contact. Or you can just know that that tender's due up in next year. I'm going to go for that because the company that's got it now is nowhere near as good as me and I'm better than them and I'm going to beat them. But at least you know who they are. And then at the very beginning of the training, I think I gave you a link as well, uh, at the very beginning, um, and when you get the slides too, the, um, the council publishes a monthly report that lists payments made to suppliers with a value more than £250. That, all, all the names of the companies are on there as well. So that's how you find out. So hopefully that addresses that question on um, how do we know, um, you know, how can I get on to um, people that are already supplying. OK, so know who the incumbent supplier is if it's not you, because you need to beat that incumbent supplier. OK, break down each question. We've just done that. Use headings. Yeah. Use persuasive language. Yeah. If you are saying we can take on an apprentice. I read that and go, we can. If I'd read, we will take on an apprentice, it's a lot more positive, persuasive and strong than we can. Because can, to me, sounds like you don't really want to. Um, provide evidence. Really, really important that you provide evidence of um, you doing the job. If you only just set your company up before, your experience, uh, if your company's been established a while, a similar work that you've done, we've looked at all those evidence that we can use. Quantify facts. Avoid using terms such as we have a low staff turnover. What's low? What is low? Quantify it. In the last year, we have lost two members of staff. Our staff turnover is 3%. Against an industry average of 33%, which means that our staff stay longer, they're more loyal, they're more committed, therefore they have a higher quality standard, higher productivity rates, know the contract better because they've been with us longer. You know, um, we have a fast response time. <laughs> right, what's fast? Yeah, we will respond within 30 minutes. That's what I want to hear. Quantified facts. Avoid large, low, many, quick, slow, long. Get rid of all that and put some facts in. Yeah. We have years of service in the industry. How many years? Just tell me. Yeah. 
Use graphics if you're allowed. You've seen some of my graphics. I'll put pictures in, I'll put uh, photographs in, I'll put screenshots of testimonials in, of review sites in. If you're allowed, check your instructions. And deadlines and deadlines, um, create a plan, look at how long you've got, what's going on generally in your life um, over the next couple of weeks and, and create a time plan to make sure that you will get that tender written in time. Normally you've got three to four weeks, sometimes less, depends how big the tender is, but you need to be on time. You cannot miss the deadline because your whole, all the work you have done will just be discarded if you miss the deadline. And I am on 13.59. Hey, so I, my deadline is just about hit. So I've actually got just a bit of a copy here of that uh, new and contract register. I went on it just before this training today. For example, um, if you were um, provided occupational health and employee assistance programmes um, to Newham, uh, I can tell you that that contract is due up in... Oh, I've just cut that off, so I can't actually... It's cut off when it's due, but it tells me when it started and when it ends, but I just cut the end date off when I printed it, so I can't tell you. Um, there's also... It, and it tells you who's doing it now, People Asset Management Limited. Uh, this is all available to you. It's available to anybody. It, 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 it's out there. It's not confidential. Um, if you provide service and maintenance and repair of automatic barriers and security gates, if we've got anybody out there that does that, um, yep, they, they, Newham have got a contract for that. Um, they let they awarded that contract in January 2022 to CERTA Security. So it's all there. Go and have a look. See if there's a contract for what you do. See when it's up for renewal next, because that's where you need to be and that's where you need to be bidding to win that work. Okay, does anybody, um, I don't know with Julia or Walsh, if you want to hit me with any questions, because we have, it is, I know it is a bang on, well, we've got one minute, but uh, I'm sure if people can hang on for another minute or two, I can maybe answer some questions. Anybody? Right. Um, there was a question about disaster recovery and business continuity. And do you need one? Can we not just say um, we won't charge them if we don't deliver or something along those lines? Even if you're a manufacturer, you, everybody needs, every company, it doesn't matter what you do and where you are in the supply chain, you need your own disaster recovery and business continuity plan to say how you will carry on. Um, and, and where you will go and how you will still communicate and how your staff will still work, et cetera. So in my opinion, every company needs disaster recovery, business continuity. Um, somebody's asked you have to be a registered, com registered company. No, sole trader, absolutely fine. You just need to make sure you clearly clarify what you are. However, if you are a one man sole trader, you just, or one woman sole trader, you just need to make sure that you are realistically bidding for the right tenders um, as in you're not going to go for a 50 million one that needs you know 500 people on the job so just be realistic um right somebody's asked about this duns number and they're saying um newham only want duns yeah newham use duns dun and bradstreet but other councils will use experian equifax so just be, be be aware that it's not always just duns that they use for credit uh checking but newham use duns so get yourself on dun and bradstreet and get a, a number it's free um i think we covered the price one subcontractor associates are covered um Yeah, I think I covered that one about subcontractors. You do need to declare if you're using subcontractors. You do need to uh, say who you're going to use um, if, uh, to do that job. It's not just who you use. They're only interested in their tender, their job. So, you know, if you are going to use a lot of subcontractors on that job, you do need to be prepared to declare them. It, I know it's difficult and there's a lot of information, but you do need to be prepared to declare them. OK, is there any other questions, Julia, do you know? Yes, uh, we do have a few more questions. Um, so, um, Jan is asking, we're a very small uh, but busy business. I'm thinking of engaging a professional tendering company. With an address comment that there should be a passion behind competing for a tender, what would be the address advice about paying for someone else um, to complete the tender? And would it be just as hard work as the... Prime docs still have to be gathered, etc. 
Um, yeah, I mean, that's exactly obviously what my business does. We write tenders for other companies. So, yeah, I mean, if anybody wants to speak to me, I, I know the council don't mind that. If you want to link in with me, Andrea Charles on LinkedIn, if you want to phone our office, it's Clip Business Solutions with a K. We can talk to you about supporting. Yes, obviously, there's a huge, uh, th there is a huge benefit to using a professional tender writing company. Not everybody wants to do that. Not everybody can afford to do that. Uh, it will, the price depends on how big the tender is, how much work there is to do. It's like how long is a piece of string. We can talk to you about that there's a massive uh, benefit to using an external professional tender writer because we know what we're doing we know how to write we don't know what you do so you need to be massively involved because we need to talk to you all the way through about how you do it and what you do so it is a joint uh, project um but obviously we know how it's marked so everything that you've been through today that's what we're doing all the time so yeah there is a benefit it will give you um it will give you an advantage um but you still need to get your price right because a professional tender writing company has nothing to do with your price you need to get your price right so yeah it's a bit of a, a, a bit of a partnership there okay. I'm working to see. yeah that's all i have sharing the space so i can't get on the questions one moment Okay. If there's anyone on the line that wants to ask a question, just raise your hands and we'll unmute you guys so you can speak directly with Andrea. It would be quite nice to hear some of the voices. I'll try there. and copy all the questions in the chat and the um, and the other uh, and in the Q and A before we finish, so that we can make sure we've got back to everybody. There's a very a lot of thank you, uh, Andrea. So thank you so much for the animated session. I know four hours is a long time for you to deliver something like this. What an amazing job, well done. Amazing, yeah. Brilliant. I mean, obviously, if people are still online, if they do want to obviously send oh. any feedback in, that would be absolutely fabulous. I know Margaret and her team would be welcome feedback. Um, and it's good that we know that, you know, if it's been useful for you, please give us feedback. Please let um, Newham know. Please, you've know, all been emailed, loads of information. If you've got two minutes to send an email back with some feedback, that would be absolutely brilliant for the team, um, obviously, to know that it's been a useful session. So um, you've all put thank yous in the chat. We will copy those. It really means a lot. Thank you for your time today. Please link in with me if you want to. Please also just take two minutes to send an email to you and back just to say thank you. That'll be really, really great. Thank you. We're going to pop um, our email address into the chat as well. So again, you uh, you're welcome to send in queries or feedback on that email address, please. Thank you. Okay, thanks everybody for your time. Four hours has flown. Thanks, Andrea. Thank you so much. So we hope thank everyone you. learned a lot. Um, please join us again for other planned workshops. Uh, with regards to Andrea's workshop, we'll endeavour to get you the handouts uh, with our post-webinar survey as soon as we can, uh, hopefully close of play this Friday. Uh, the recording for the session will take slightly longer because obviously our IT team will have to create a link. Uh, hopefully everything goes well once we end the session and stop recording. And apologies if we didn't get to answer all your questions, uh, but we have made a note of all the questions that haven't been answered and we'll get back to all the attendees with the Q&A type um, things so that hopefully we get some answers. But most of all, we hope you feel braver, more confident and better equipped to bid for some of our projects. Have a rest of the day. Okay, somebody's asking what's my name. Andrea Childs is my name. I think somebody wants to link in with me. So, uh, yeah, I am on LinkedIn. Um, you'll get me on LinkedIn. So, brilliant. Okay. Well, everybody's free to go and get some lunch. So, enjoy the yeah. rest of the day. <laughs> I'm hungry. Take care, Andrea. Take care. Bye. Bye.